Good evening and welcome to our Board of Select meeting. It's June 22nd, 2020, and uh, it is 7 p.m. right on the dot. And um, keeping uh, with the agenda, we have some special guests tonight on Zoom uh, to talk to us um, and the school committee. And we have our school committee chair here with us tonight, Stacy Raffi. And we have our uh, representative, state representative, Carolyn Dykema with us. And we have uh, the Senate president, Karen Spilka, with us. And we appreciate you taking the time to meet with us. We know you're very busy, and uh, it means a lot to us and the residents that you take the time, as you do a couple of times a year, um, to help us out. So with that in mind, I will give the floor to the uh, state representative first, Carolyn Dykema, and then, and then the Senate President, Karen Spilka, to sort of give our town an update and what they might know about state funding and whatever else you want to talk about. So we'll start with you, Carolyn. Thanks, Mark. I, I appreciate that and good to see everyone here tonight. Um, when, when you're uh, in the legislature, you learn uh, pretty quickly that uh, you generally defer to your senator first, being in the, uh, in the other chamber. And, and given our senator's esteemed position as the Senate president, I guess I would uh, you know, defer to her to offer some initial comments. Sure, absolutely. Karen? Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Carolyn. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'll go first, or or I'll go after you. Um, we can all be very proud of your role, Karen, in the in the Senate. So, well, thank well you. Earned. Thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a great relationship. We uh, work really well as partners to help Holliston uh, with whatever uh, we can do to help. <clears throat> I want to thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. It's always a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Mark. Um, you know, I, I want to thank you for your service on the board. Uh, it's been great working with you. And I know, I know that we'll continue to, to work and see you. So uh, it's just a little bit of a goodbye, but not a, not a yeah. permanent. So thank you. And actually, thank, you. You know, thank the select board, all of the members. I want to thank the school committee um, and acknowledge Stacy Raffi as, as the chair. Um, congratulations, town administrator Jeff Ritter. Uh, I know uh, you will be retiring soon, so I would like to thank you and thank you for all of your collaboration and your service and your assistance and uh, a job very well done in partnership with Holliston. A lot of, lot of uh, goodbyes, actually. Uh, and then uh, Superintendent Brad Jackson. Um, Brad, you, you have been a partner for a very, very long time, uh, not only for Holliston, but for all statewide school issues. You've been a great resource um, and, and a good friend too. So I thank you and wish you the best of luck. And I know we'll be hearing from you, continuing to hear from you in your new capacity. I do want to thank, uh, because of all that's gone on, particularly lately with the pandemic, the health department and Scott for all uh, that you've done. Uh, thank you, police, the police officers and Chief Stone, firefighters uh, and Chief Cassidy. Uh, all of you have played such a large role the last few months. And it's really because of all of you that are here and, and, and around the town working so well together that Holliston has weathered uh, this pandemic and this ep economic recession so well. So kudos to all of you. Uh, good luck for all that are, have elections tomorrow. Remember, I um, just want to remind residents to vote um, if you haven't already. I'm just going to give a couple of minutes about the budget and then talk about just a few other issues. Um, you know, I think you know, like at your level, on the local level, COVID-19 represents a two-fold crisis for state finances as well. Started out and continues to be a pu public health crisis, 
requiring major expenditures on health care, public safety, and other responses. And then the second, because it was a, such an extreme public health response and crisis, activities that generate state revenue are clearly have been at a standstill. We're finally beginning to uh, trend upwards, uh, downwards with our COVID cases, upwards with our economic activity. So we'll see what, what happens here. Um, there are three factors that may basically make the fiscal year 21 budget outlook uncertain. And I know this isn't a surprise to any of you. Uh, first, we're not certain yet how, how the pandemic will continue to play out. As I mentioned, and you all know, the trend is downward, thankfully. As a state, we are doing well. We don't know if it will spike back up again, like it is in other areas. Hopefully, our reopening has been uh, paced at a, at, a, at a good pace that um, that will not happen. So second, we don't know uh, how far state revenues will decline, but the estimates have been, um, you know, an estimate of uh, for next year, our budget being in a deficit up to $6 billion. That's on a $43, $44 billion budget uh, of $6 billion. Um, I do know and I'm glad that Holliston under the CARES Act has, has been allocated $1.3 million, but I know that the um, uh, the criteria for that is not very flexible and we're working to try to make that more flexible. So that brings us to the availability of federal funds and the flexibility. Um, for example, back for some of you, you may remember in 2009-10 when we went through the big, you know, really the recession, um, we level funded um, uh, school aid chapter 70, but that's because the state got a billion dollars of K to 12 funds uh, from the federal government. Thus far, we have gotten 200 million. So we need to really be pushing and the Senate sent a letter to the uh, US Senate and the, the administration. We sent it to the president. We sent it to everybody asking for more federal funds and I urge the town to send a, a letter to our, our delegation to, for the same, asking for uh, more, more available funds and more flexibility in the funds. Um, so we are looking at, uh, you know, how much, um, where, where we will be. Uh, we are looking at trying to do some sort of local treatment to help. Uh, I know in the past we've, the House and Senate, and it's been a while, have done local aid resolutions or agreements or statements. I know that we are trying to do that as well uh, to help you. We are, we are passing this week a 1/12th budget for the month of July um, at $5.25 billion. We're taking uh, the fiscal 2020 budget amounts uh, the re and even though it's 5.525, it's a little bit more because in the beginning of the year, there's some upfront costs, particularly federal costs, to get reimbursed later on. We have to shell out the money in the beginning. So we are working hard um, at trying to provide as much guidance as possible. Please stay tuned. Keep in touch with Carolyn and me on uh, going forward. But at least uh, the, the, for the month of July and into August, um, there will be uh, the, the 5.25 budget. Um, I do want to say that despite, you know, some of the tough times, I'm glad that we were able to, for this year, provide 200,000 for school stop opioid addiction before it starts. Um, you know, for using for depression screening, professional development and wellness resources. It was a great use of the funds that were needed, clearly. 
100,000 was provided for fire and public safety improvements to communications um, to help get the repeaters throughout the town so public safety personnel can improve communications to help to help with that. Um, and I know uh, that there were other uh, earmarks and funds that came to the town. Um, I know also that there's a lot going on, like with Route 16 and the corridor, uh, the traffic. I want to commend Select Board member, member Tina Hine for working so hard. And the town received just 16,000 recently in March, um, and half of the program is complete. That really has been a successful uh, program, quick completion. Um, and I, I am very, uh, you know, I congratulate uh, the work that has been done on this. Um, just to mention, just really quickly before I turn it over, we've been busy legislatively. Uh, we recently passed, and I know the House will be taking it up, I think the Speaker said next week, a bill to curtail Triple E. I know that that has been a really big issue in Holliston, Ashland, the Metro West last summer. Um, Tripoli is spreading. It, it's been coming from the South Coast. And uh, they are predicting it's being spread even more further West and North. And unfortunately, we did not have a hard frost this winter. I know it felt cold at times, but there was no hard frost to freeze the mosquitoes to really get rid of them. So uh, they are predicting a bad mosquito summer, um, unfortunately. So this bill would help uh, the state sort of take control. The committee that worked on this, Committee on Public Health, worked really hard on working with uh, not only the municipalities, but the environmentalists, the conservationists, the pollinators, and all of the folks to put forth a bill for the next two years to try to help curtail the, the outbreak of Triple E and West Nile virus. Um, we are working on a, in the Senate, a uh, <coughs> bill on racial justice to uh, have some police training, to uh, ban excessive use of force, to have stronger data collection and other uh -oh. areas. We are doing a, an active listening session. We have our committees going out. Uh, a week and a half ago, we had a five hour economic development and workforce and labor recovery and listening session. Um, and the, the purpose of these listening sessions are to hear from the folks involved in the trenches in these areas. So. A week and a half ago, it was economic development and workforce. Coming up is public health and health care. Then there'll be a child care one, uh, potentially one on elders, et cetera. That so much has happened with this pandemic. What do we need to really help focus on to help speed our recovery for our residences, our cities and towns, and our businesses? They will help give us the fuel to help us focus and, and um, as to what we need to focus on coming up. So, you know, that, that's it. I still am hoping to get, um, we did a prescription drug reform bill last November. I'm hoping we can get that on the governor's desk that would lower the cost of prescription drugs. We did a strong mental health reform bill in February. Um, and this week we're doing another health care bill, the last of our sort of trifecta in health care to um, make sure that once COVID-19 is behind us, that we still continue with telemedicine and other areas that have proven so important to our health care system. I am um, also this morning just to end with transportation, because I know that's important to so many of you. Um, I had a talk with Stephanie Pollack, the secretary this morning on uh, the I-90 um, Alston intermodal, multimodal project. And um, they are looking at other alternatives and will continue to be really vigilant to make sure that whatever happens, 
that uh, the Metro West Central Mass is well represented, and I know Carolyn is actively involved in this and other Metro West legislators uh, to make sure that the uh, that this whole project is viewed as an opportunity, not just for Metro West that we're a byproduct of fixing the I-90 in Austin, but that this is viewed as an actual opportunity to improve the commute, to improve the, the ride from Metro West into Boston, to make it more accessible, <clears throat> uh, affordable, uh, comfortable, frequent, and that, bless you, and that uh, there will be no toll increases because of that, 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 that we will fight. Um, so these are just a smattering of things before us um, and we've been really busy. So thank you for, for listening. I, I could go on, but I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Carolyn, uh, to talk a little bit about what's happening in the house. Um, before we go on to Carolyn, I, I uh, failed to recognize our superintendent of schools is with us, and um, he's been an amazing um, educator and administrator for our town for many years, and the board wants to wish you well with your next endeavor, and we can't thank you enough for all you do. So thank you, Brad. And I wanted to recognize also there's many members of the school committee uh, with us tonight as this is a joint meeting with our Senate president and uh, our state representative. So thank you all for, for joining us and taking the time. Carolyn, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Mark. And I just want to echo those comments to Jeff and Brad. Um, both of you, you know, long tenures, really great, great help and support for the town and very responsive to local residents. So you, uh, you will be missed, but we of course wish you very well in your next chapter and next adventure. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it will be, will be great. And it's just great to be here and be part of this. I was before you, I was trying to remember when that was maybe a month, month and a half ago um, about budget issues. And I know that that has been very uh, front and center for the town. Uh, and, and I want to recognize, uh, as, if it, if it's, as if it needs to be said, but I think it does need to be said, how um, responsive and how much the, the local officials have really stepped up to meet the challenges that have been presented by COVID-19 almost overnight. And when I think about um, what's had to be done with uh, schools and transitioning the children um, from a traditional classroom environment to a home setting via IT, uh, and, and the parental support that's needed, uh, in addition to uh, elections challenges, it really, um, it's a tremendous amount of work. And I just want to state today that I just, I recognize it as a resident and as a state representative, um, the amount of uh, not only effort, but TLC uh, and energy that's gone to that, to that effort. It's, it's an unprecedented time. And I think that there's been an unprecedented response on behalf of local officials. So I just wanna thank you for that. Um, at the state level, we've had a range of challenges and the Senator um, touched on some of them. Every type of state, uh, I would say safety net system that you can imagine, whether that be housing availability, um, foreclosures, evictions, uh, childcare, uh, just about anything that you can imagine has been touched by this pandemic in a dramatic way. So as we try to address um, kind of keeping a lot of those safety net supports in place uh, and, and making them more robust for the people that have really been terribly hard hit by this pandemic. All of us have, but there are certain um, populations we know that have been harder hit than others and, and um, making sure that we have the systems in place and the supports in place to, to, to help them has been incredibly important. But at the same time, obviously as, as your legislator and as the Senator as well, you know, supporting your needs in local government is tremendously important to us. So uh, I know that you had a number of questions about budgeting and how, of course, you know, can we all present budgets and put budgets together when there's so much uncertainty. And I thought I would just um, maybe re reiterate some of the points that I made at the last meeting, which was sort of about the how the budget process is working at the state level, which for, while there's very little certainty, maybe it will give you some sense of, of um, you know, how this is gonna play out in the next few months that might inform some of your budgeting decisions. So we, um, 
the state budget, we have a, a consensus revenue figure that was uh, the initial fiscal year 21 budget was based on. Um, that revenue figure is obviously no longer accurate. So the state, in order to do a full budget, will need to readdress that consensus revenue figure, which is an agreed upon number um, of revenue from both the House, the Senate, and the administration that we move forward with. Um, based on all the economic information that's been coming forward from the, you know, lists of economists that have come and presented before the Ways and Means Committee, um, we really won't have a good sense of what those new numbers are going to be until at least late summer, uh, at a minimum. And, um, you know, it's going to be very dependent, as the Senator said, on how the economy improves, how quickly it improves. And to add a little uh, good news, I guess we entered uh, the second phase of phase two today, which is the expanded opening of indoor seating and restaurants to a limited capacity with precautions, but it's definitely a movement in the right direction because the numbers have been very good. Uh, Massachusetts, we can be really proud. Uh, we're wearing our face masks, we're doing all the right things around social distancing and it's really being seen in the numbers, which is then being translated into this movement through our phases. So in addition to restaurants opening things like, um, you know, spa services, um, some home fitness services, uh, all of those things, again, point to uh, caut cautious optimism, I guess, in terms of where we are headed. But until we get more solid revenue uh, estimates, uh, you know, we're sort of in the same holding pattern that you are having to figure out how to deal with state budget. So as the Senator mentioned, we passed uh, in house today, a 112th budget, which would local fund, uh, level fund local aid, um, you know, until we can get to the point uh, where we can get more solid numbers, uh, which at least gives, gives hopefully the cities and towns some, some solid numbers for the short term. Um, so other, other things that we've done, recognizing the, the um, challenges that we're, you're facing today, as well as the ones that are gonna be um, ahead of us, I know the IT piece has been very important, and I know that the school committee is, is thinking about some IT costs that the schools are gonna, gonna be looking at for the upcoming year. Uh, the House passed an IT bond bill that has two uh, matching grant programs in there that might be of interest to the town. One is for um, school technology. And so there's obviously an application process and a criteria that will be developed for how that money is allocated. But that is a uh, $40 million in there in the house, in the house version of that bond bill for education funding um, for IT. And then on the town side, realizing that, that connectivity for meetings like this is also important. Um, there's $100 million in the uh, bond bill for a matching grant program for cities and towns mm -hmm. to enhance that uh, technology uh, capability um, as your needs uh, see fit. On the transportation side, one of the things at this time of year uh, that we usually do is the Chapter 90 uh, bond authorization for the reimbursement for city um, and town roadways, sidewalks, uh, local transportation needs. So both the House and Senate at this point have passed a, uh, an authorization for uh, at a minimum $200 million for the upcoming year. And that's going to be kind of bouncing back and forth, I think, between the House and the Senate here. But hopefully done pretty soon so that uh, in, although we're a little bit late this year, uh, start putting shovels in the ground for some of that work. Um, Liz Greendale, we know tomorrow she is hard at work and, and Diane and everyone in the clerk's office on elections uh, locally in Holliston. And um, we're also, we've been thinking about elections at the federal level, both the primary in September, as well as the general election in November. And uh, both the House and Senate, again, have passed uh, expanded voting options bills, uh, which uh, not only would protect the public health by giving people the ability to vote early, vote absentee ballot um, from home, as well as uh, recognizing there are still some people that need to go into the physical uh, location, which of course in Holliston is the schools, so that will have some impact on the schools as well, but hopefully keep as many people out of the physical uh, location as possible for everyone's health and safety. And I wanna recognize uh, Liz, who was a very active participant in the debate over that bill 
and in offering some suggestions on behalf of the clerks that were, uh, some of which were included in the final legislation, including a, uh, what I thought was an ingenious idea of including uh, barcodes on the individual ballots, which will make them much easier to track and process over time. So that's sort of a, a, a good process, maybe one of the silver linings that came out of this, um, this effort. And hopefully we'll see a great voter turnout, not only tomorrow in Holliston, but also in the fall. By way of things that I'm hearing from um, constituents, which I'm sure that you're hearing as well, is the increased um, need or concerns around mental health um, and how those needs are going to very likely uh, expand in the coming months. You know, there are some impacts now, but um, given what uh, some people are seeing and having to see uh, in their homes and just experiencing levels of stress, I think there's a growing consensus that there might be a long tail to some of the mental health issues that we're experiencing. Uh, and as a member of the Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, uh, all of those uh, issues are impacted by this pandemic, um, whether it be mental health for young people and children um, who don't have access to school, who may be seeing things at home that are, are difficult. We've got folks that are um, recovering from substance use that are used to having face-to-face -face meetings as part of their treatment. Uh, and I've talked to a number of them who have said, you know, the, the online is great and it's really helpful and better than nothing, but uh, that in-person face-to-face um, time, I think in every aspect of our lives, including in our local government and our schools, is really something that we're all missing. And we're, uh, I think, eager to get back to seeing each other. And, but there also, I think, will be things that we need to, to work through uh, as we come out of this. And uh, I think all of us and the Senator mentioned are committed to doing what we can at the state level to support uh, efforts around mental health, especially the great work that's being done by groups like Youth and Family Services and which in Holliston is just uh, an incredibly strong and vibrant uh, and responsive group and giving them support so that they can really get into the community and find out what those needs are and respond to them. Uh, is incredibly important to me and to a lot of us. Um, the other thing I guess I will mention is uh, is the triple E bill that's making its way through the legislature. And I just wanted to highlight um, in Holliston in particular, I've had a lot of uh, constituent feedback around the use of pesticides. Uh, and clearly as we look at public health, uh, there are a lot of public health issues and, and a number of people are concerned uh, as am I about the potential public health uh, implications of broad pesticide use. And as part of the triple E bill, uh, which is going through the legislature, which is necessary to address this uh, likely two or three year cycle for triple E, uh, we will be coming into year two, which is why, uh, as the Senator mentioned, we are very likely to have some significant triple E concerns again this fall, which last year, those of you may remember, we had some uh, restrictions around evening events uh, and in fact, some evening, evening events had to be canceled because of uh, Tripoli and mosquito concerns. So those are likely to come up again. And what this bill would, it would give a little more latitude to state government to be able to do some of the um, spraying and response that they had to do under emergency circumstances last year. This would allow them to be a little more, uh, have a little more foresight in how they do that. Um, that said, I was able to add, um, with the support of many, a provision that would recognize that just broad spraying for a lot of reasons is probably not a long-term solution to Tripoli. And we really need to step back and um, put together a long-term plan that takes into account feedback from a lot of experts and stakeholders about the most appropriate, uh, most uh, public health aware and most environmentally um, sensitive approach that we can take to that. What's, what's turning out to be a growing long-term challenge around not just triple E, but um, arbovirus, which is viruses spread by ticks, mosquitoes, all of these things that we know in Holliston were kind of a hot spot for, um, for many reasons. So um, continuing to work on that and just glad we were able to make some process with that long progress with the long-term planning on that issue. So I guess on that note, I will, um, I will turn it back over to the board and uh, happy to respond to whatever questions you may have for us. Thank you, Carolyn. I don't know where you and Karen get all your energy from, but uh, you sure do 
represent all of us very well. We can't thank you enough. So we'll start the questioning time now with the clerk of the board, Tina Hine. Thank you both, both for being here, uh, Senator Silka and Representative Dyke. I first want to say that I greatly appreciate the consistent message that's been coming out of the both of your offices on uh, social distancing, on face coverings, hand washing, and so on, those standard safety protocols. I think that it's absolutely resulted in good outcomes for both the state but also our town, and I appreciate the help that it gives both our Board of Health and our Emergency Management Director in the work that they're doing to keep our residents here in town um, safe and healthy. So again, very much appreciate the consistent and strong message that's coming out. And the state numbers today, uh, Representative Dykema, that you shared in your, in your daily email are, are great news. Uh, it's great to see things trending down like that. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple developments here uh, in town that, are, that uh, I, I take note of uh, this week, last week. Uh, the first is the plans underway to apply for the state revolving funds uh, through our um, DPW superintendent's office. Uh, it's a number one priority for the town of Holliston to supply safe drinking water, and that application should be prepared and be submitted so that Holliston can move forward. Um, and receive hopefully some state revolving funds to allow for the development creation of our or, uh, build rather of our new water treatment um, facility. And the second is a newer development as of uh, last week, I believe, the Mass DOT grant program for shared streets and spaces. Very hopeful that uh, this week we will develop a, pr a couple proposals uh, to submit for the DOT uh, grant. Um, I think it's the number one priority for the quality of life of our residents, for the safety uh, and healthy uh, lifestyles of our residents, as well as for the economic development long term, but also in response to this pandemic. So I uh, hope to be able to present some applications, some proposals um, for this program. And then on a personal note, very much hoping to hear about the Citizens Legislative Seminar, hoping that that will be rescheduled for the fall. I know that was postponed this in March, I think and uh, hoping to be able to attend that this fall if it's offered again or whenever it's offered again. Uh, and then my only question, um, and this comes back to Senator Spilka's comments about the CARES Act and flexibility, I'm wondering if that could be described a little bit, what is meant uh, when you say more flexibility um, in terms of eligible costs, I presume, but I was wondering if you could clarify that a little bit. Sure. Uh, first of all, um, just to go back to the revolving fund and the mass DOT, the applications, please let Carolyn and me know when you do this uh, as a town so that we can submit letters in support. That Thank makes, you. Yep. makes a difference. Definitely the state agencies look to see if there are such letters of support. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, Jeff, you know that and, and others. Uh, the Citizens Legislative Seminar, uh, yeah, we, the Senate puts that on twice a year. Unfortunately, I apologize, it was uh, postponed, but uh, I am hoping that we will have another session this fall. Usually we do it fall and spring. Um, and in any event, Tina, there's a spot for you the next time we have it. Um, Thank you. So don't worry about that. And then the CARES Act, the funding that, that was put forward by the, the federal uh, House and Senate um, and signed by, by uh, Trump, um, have strict eligibility criteria to access it so that it's just because like the, the, if a town is, um, is eligible for $1.3 million doesn't mean that they automatically get it they have to, they would be reimbursed for it, but they have to show there's a certain time period that they spent, uh, spent it, the certain uh, issues, it has to be COVID-19 uh, wholly and totally, but not something that was already planned in, in either the, the budget or planned by the town. There's a very strict eligibility requirements um, that did not appear, has, has not appeared in other uh, uh, federal uh, time when they've done uh, funding bills like this, like in 09 and 10 and other times. Um, so there is discussion uh, amongst the, the U.S. House and Senate about making that a little bit more flexible and fluid so that cities and towns and the state for that matter, other states, will be able to access all of it. I participate in a, um, 
a, a, a national conference of state legislators call sometimes that where there are other state Senate presidents or speakers. And uh, some of the comments have been to the point where it's been so difficult for the states to utilize all of the funding that some of the states are concerned they're going to have to send some of the money back if they can't meet the, the requirements. So if there's any concerns, we can certainly work um, with all of the folks, in, in, you know, and get you in contact with the right folks, whether it be at the Department of Revenue or local services or whoever to ensure if, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. John, do you have a question? I do have a couple. Good evening, Senator Spilka, Representative Dykman. Thanks so much for joining us. And I, I'd like to echo uh, my colleagues' uh, support of all the work you've done for us. We really appreciate it. Two questions. Uh, first for you, Senator Spilka, if I could. Um, I think you just mentioned that uh, earlier the Division of Local Services announced that the local aid for communities would be funded at the FY20 level starting in, on July 1st. Is that correct? Uh, not not a permanent, not for the year, but in starting in July, it will be level funded. During the interim budget period? Yes, that, that was passed, which is for the month of July at this point, yes. So that's great news at the local level, but I'm also hearing that, you know, the revenue picture, as dire as it is, shows about a 15% drop off. And so my question is, as a local planning official, should I be worried about going from basically a baseline revenue number for July, maybe August, to a drop-off potentially once the revenue picture firms up? Would the legislature be looking at a local aid reduction of as much as 15 or more percent in FY21? Is that, is that possible? You know, I, I wish I could answer that tonight, but unfortunately I can't because so much of it depends upon, at, you know, how quickly our uh, economic recovery bounces back, but mostly how much the federal government is going to kick in the next round of funding. Uh, you know, I, I um, I was talking among some of the other senators and, and Richie Neal, Congressman Neal, and you know the House did a very generous, the U.S. House did a very generous funding of 500 billion for states, and then on top of that, another 250 billion for cities and towns, uh, and the the money would be flexible. And then on top of that, more billions for K to 12 education and more for child care and other things. Um, even if the Senate does not adopt that, and uh, it's unlikely that they will adopt that full uh, package, um, we could be getting a significant uh, source of revenue from the federal government. But I'm ho and I'm hoping that by the end of July, we have a better picture all of the states are suffering. All of the cities and towns across America are having a tough time. So it's not just a few set of certain states or a few cities and towns, but everybody all across the country. So there is pressure on all of the, the US reps, all of the US senators and the administration for that matter uh, to, to help uh, fund some of the, the loss of revenue by, by that has happened over the past few months. The federal government can print money. They can function in a deficit. The state cannot, cities and towns cannot. Um, so it, it's easier and the federal government has to step up to the plate. So we are hoping and indications are that we will know hopefully by the end of July so we're hoping that we can take uh, more action later on this summer. Well, I, I guess if I could just, just add one, ahead, one thing that, to that, John, and, and I think that you know, the uncertainty around timing of the federal, federal funding is one of the most frustrating things for me because you know, the federal government never seems to, to do things quite in the time frame that they originally anticipate doing them. So if, if they don't do it in July, what does that mean for us? And, and how do we fill those gaps? And I just wanted to point out that we did 
um, probably close to a month ago now, um, authorized some interim borrowing for the state. So that just um, provides some additional capacity if we have to wait longer than we you know, originally expected. We do have a little bit of latitude there uh, recognizing you know, that, that these are some pretty important programs that uh, you can't, uh, you have to maintain them. You can't just kind of, uh, you know, scale back dramatically with the thought that you can just come back and refund them again and bring them right back up to where they were. So there's a recognition that some interim funding may be, may be needed. And I think we're, you know, we're ready to do that. My last question, uh, probably to both of you is uh, looking ahead into the legislative process. Is it going to be streamlined with respect to budget planning? Are the House and the Senate going to prepare a, uh, a conference budget right away? Or are we likely to see a House version and a Senate version as we conventionally would? I would suggest that you will see a, uh, an unprecedented budget process, uh, unprecedented times uh, with unprecedented solutions. That's why right now the House and Senate Ways and Means Chairs have pulled together a supplemental budget to ensure that we get the full reimbursement from the federal government and that has been prepared jointly. Uh, we have done it in agreement. The House Chair of Ways and Means, the Senate Chair of Ways and Means, and the Secretary of Administration and Finance are all working together. I don't think this has ever happened before with including the, the administration. So working together in, in preparing <clears throat> a budget for next year. Um, and that's why you know we did the joint, we agreed uh, the three branches on the 112th budget that we passed today. That we we um, started going on its process and we are working on a joint budget because right now we would be uh, almost done with negotiations of the conference, the House and Senate. Uh, we don't have the luxury to have the House do a budget, then the Senate do a budget, and then a conference. We just don't have the time at all. So I do hope and I believe that there will be a, a joint agreement among the branches. And your best guess would be sometime after July. It, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. You know, it, we at least have a, a 112th for July. We'll have to see what happens and when the federal government takes action. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Mark. And now uh, we'll turn it over to uh, the school committee chair, uh, Stacy Raffi, and she'll. Um, ask questions and then she can um, ask other members of the school committee if they have questions. So you'll run the meeting for a little bit. Great. Thanks for having me. And <sighs> hello, Senator, and hello, Representative Dykema. How are you? Great to see you. Great to see you looking well. Um, on behalf of the school committee, it is always our pleasure to work with you and your offices. And um, so for that, uh, we have a great working relationship and your communication throughout this um, crisis has been uh, really important and great work and, and we appreciate that. Um, I think when I say on behalf of the committee and other school committees in our area, um, like you, the things that are top of mind for us are now a mile long. Uh, but I think the biggest issue is the the districts are waiting to hear from the Department of Ed with the guidance as to how schools and districts need to move forward uh, for reopening schools. And with that comes a price tag. And so that is very much on the top of our minds. And uh, we passed a resolution this afternoon that I have since forwarded to your offices. Um, we are deeply concerned about the price tag that comes along with opening school during a pandemic that, you know, people in our generation have never seen before. So that is, that is of concern uh, for us. In addition, as um, Carolyn alluded to a little bit earlier, mental health is also a, a big concern um, in what COVID is doing to all of us, but in, especially our children and our students. Um, so 
that is another concern for us. But, um, you know, we're in this together, and we're all working hard, and so I know personally that we will get through it, and we appreciate your leadership. With that, I'd like to offer the budget subcommittee to be able to ask questions initial their questions first, uh, because they are meeting weekly um, to work through the finances. So Lisa and Andy and Anne Louise and Brad and Keith are on the budget subcommittee. So Anne Louise. Um, I, I have a couple of initial questions and then I want to make sure that um, my subcommittee members have the opportunity to ask some questions as well. Um, first of all, Senator Spilka and Representative Dykema, thank you so very much, not only for your like copious notes, just for coming tonight and doing this because there's nothing like the opportunity to be able to dialogue with you directly and you are always so helpful and so informative. Um, I could hardly keep up and I'm a pretty fast typist. So thank you. It was actually in a stunning list of things that you have been working on, not only recently, um, but that you've accomplished over the past many months, even pre-COVID. So thank you for that. And also for your updates as well, that um, that Stacy was right to note that, that was, they've been enormously helpful. Um, I had a couple of questions with respect to some updates that you brought up. One was related to the, um, I, I want to make sure I'm referring to it correctly, but the technology grant, um, and it has two components, one for city and towns and one for schools. I want to make sure we understand that correctly because we did submit um, a fairly significant request for the CARES Act reimbursement, and a portion of that was related to technology that um, we have not only needed uh, this past uh, three months, but that we anticipate needing um, even, even if we physically go back to school, but in some fashion where we have to manage part of the population at home, student population and staff at home during certain points in time. So should we not be submitting for CARES reimbursement if there's a separate grant associated directly with technology for schools. I think you're um, on mute, Carolyn. Carolyn, why don't you take that? Because I think you were referring to the House version of the IT bond bill. Right, which is now in the Senate. So the Senate has the bill, the House. Why don't I, the best thing to do, probably Anne Louise recognizing that the legislation hasn't passed yet, so um, in terms of, of when your needs may be, you know, that would be a factor. But why don't I send you the bill and highlight the section that's relevant for you to take a look at. And then I'm sure the Senator would welcome any feedback that you have um, with respect to that before it leaves the Senate. Okay, um, that's really I important. Oh, I, do want to, I do want to mention that um, we had discussions last week and this week in leadership with the governor and the speaker. Um, because the money, it can be reimbursed from the state side as well as the city and town. I don't know if you're referring to Chromebooks at all. Um, if you're referring to Chromebooks, the governor, the speaker, and I decided to do that in a separate grant fund, sort of, sort of, sort of where 25 million would be provided by the state and 25 million by cities and towns, so that you could pool it together. Okay. And, and ultimately, the the city and town would be the CARES money, the federally funded portion of the CARES money. And the state funds would also be federal, so it would be at no cost to the state or city or Holliston if, if that was the way to go. We, there will be actually a, an announcement coming out within a day or two. Okay, that's so helpful. Thank you. And I would value getting that, that information. Um, just for your knowledge, it, Chrome, I mean, it's for student and staff devices. That's a part yeah. of it. There yeah. are some, there are a few other related technology requests because um, distance learning, even if it's only a portion of our students at home at any given point in time, we have to plan for the possibility 
that all students are going to be in that scenario at some point, even if they're rotating in and out, but it implies other things potentially, including monitors in the classroom. So if there's a teacher there and a student's at home or some students are at home, the teacher has to be able to connect with both portions of the classroom, if you will. So there are some other things in there. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and I do want to uh, mention, um, I'm not certain who from the Holliston schools may be attending. Um, I was able to arrange a meeting with the uh, DESI on June 30th. Oh, okay. uh, this could be a question to ask them. By June 30th, it will be out. The, the announcement will be out. Um, at said 2 p.m. It's a Zoom meeting. Um, so, you know, any and all of the school committee and superintendent can attend, but it will be, you know, a chance to talk to them about remote learning, the school plans, uh, the Chromebooks, and what the plans are for the fall, what they know at that point, um, and to follow up with any, any on, on all questions. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you. I don't know how, I, I guess we can follow up with Kuja on how to get the link and all of that. Yes, that would be great. Um, thank you. And this she's is, on the call now, so she's aware of it. <laughs> anyway, so I saw her come in. <laughs> her hair, her hair's longer, so I'm like, it's definitely- I think different. everybody's hair is longer. Yeah, no, it's hair. been too long, so <laughs> we haven't seen each other. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so the second question relates to transportation. Um, I was curious if the transfer, transportation bill contemplated the potential increases in transportation costs that school districts may face as a result of COVID-19. I can elaborate on what the whys and wherefores, but I just thought I'd start with a broad question on whether or not there's any aspect of that bill that contemplates school district needs. Um, I'm. Karen, I don't know if you're aware of anything. I, I'm, I mean, clearly there are a lot of transportation needs um, for schools and we know that. Um, I'm not familiar with any conversation in the transportation world about that. Traditionally, that's been in more of an, an education uh, right. context. So the, the chapter 90 funds that I had mentioned for the town are, are are related to roads and not specifically to transportation like busing and and you know, special education, transportation, things like that. Okay. Well, I'll throw it up on your radar because maybe there's some other place to address this. Um, it may be under the general um, CARES Act reimbursement, but I think one of the concerns that many, many districts have is that depending on what the social distancing requirements look like, our ability to put 60 children on a bus is severely limited. Um, if, if you took, for example, houses of worship as an example, you'd have to, you know, use every other row and maybe one child per seat and suddenly you've cut capacity in half. And then we're in a scenario where we can't get all the kids physically moved to where they need to within the time limits that we have. Maybe we need more buses or more runs. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a Rubik's cube. Um, but no matter how you cut it, it dramatically increases transportation costs overnight for districts. Um, and so either the costs get managed or districts are temporarily relieved of some of the current requirements that we have for busing. And frankly, I, I'd rather not go that route in one sense because those requirements are there for a reason, but we can't we can't handle both. We can't be required to bus children and not be in a scenario where we actually can physically do it because we don't have enough buses. And to get more is, is an extraordinary uh, financial burden. So that, that was sort of, that's that issue. I don't know where that one sits. Um, the other one actually is slightly unrelated, but since I, I have the mic for a moment, I was just curious when you may know around the Triple E requirements, if there's any um, anticipated curfews coming underway, et cetera. So um, would those be implemented toward the fall or are they things that you just don't know right now? 
at this point, it's too early to tell uh, that, that in the case of a Tripoli emergency, the state could implement uh, like it did last, and, and there were some, some uh, people were told not to go outdoors, but at this point, it, it's too early. This, the bill sets a framework as to how, how the state can take action and when and what would be the steps for it to take action and creates a task force to look at uh, how we can deal with this on a permanent basis so that everybody's uh, needs and um, the situation is, is taken care of, but with a strong eye towards public safety because, yeah, as Carolyn mentioned, Holliston, Ashland, this area was a hot spot last summer and we certainly don't want uh, that to happen again. Yeah. And I guess I'd just add, Anne Louise, you know, the hope of, of doing this early, um, and because this is fairly early, we're not going to really be thinking about Tripoli in a real way until, you know, August, September, uh, maybe the end of July. But um, the hope is that we get out ahead of this, right, and start dealing with some of the wet areas that would be the breeding grounds um, for the mosquitoes before they become a problem with the hope that, you know, less, more restrictive action, like you're talking about later in the, later in the season, wouldn't be necessary. But again, it's, it, as the Senator said, it's, at this point, it's really too early to know what will happen. And that's why it's really important that we get it done sooner rather than later so that the states and cities and towns can set up what they need to set up to be prepared for our residents. Thank you so much. Um, I would just point now then to my colleagues, Andy Morton and Lisa Koshin, who also sit on the Budget Subcommittee as well as Keith and uh, Mr. Boudet, uh, Mr. Boudet and Dr. Jackson, uh, if you have any questions, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Annalise. Lisa? Oh, she's uh, on mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. I thought I unmuted myself. Um, thank you both. I want to just echo all of the gratitude. We, uh, knowing how our inboxes have exploded in the last couple of months, I cannot imagine <laughs> what yours look like. Um, but we really appreciate um, both of you so much for all you're doing. Um, my question is around advocacy. One or both of you had mentioned that it would be helpful if we advocated um, at the federal level for, you know, flexibility. I think you said particularly um, around the <clears throat> act. And I'm wondering the best way that we can do that, if we should do that just, you know, letters as a town, if we should do that separately, you know, school committee versus town, like <clears throat> if you have any tips on, you know, the best way for us to go about doing that. I think, you know, just like we sent, we had 39 out of 40 members of the Senate sign off on a strong letter. Um, as I said, we highlighted the House version of the what they call the HEROES Act um, with the anticipation that the Senate will not do that full act, but even if it did half, that would be incredibly beneficial. I, uh, I, I think that it's a very strong statement. The more people you get signed on to one letter, uh, and it makes a really big um, impact. So that's what I would recommend. Um, you know, and then you could, if you have other uh, constituents that want to do something, they can send similar letters as well, taken from what the larger letter is. Uh, and send that out. I think that is really helpful. Thank you. And I also, I think the, the congressional delegation and, and Congresswoman Clark's office, I'm sure would be very eager to hear about what your needs are. Uh, I was talking to somebody in their office a little bit ago and the congressional delegation, I think all of the Massachusetts delegation sent a letter to the administration requesting an education specific stimulus bill related to COVID. I don't know what the likelihood or the potential is of something like that, but certainly expressing your support uh, and, the, and the board's, you know, the school committee's support for that and what those funds might be uh, needed for or directed toward, I think would be very helpful to her efforts to advocate as best she can for that type of additional support. 
and I can send, um, Stacy. I guess I'll send it, to, I'll send all of this information to you, but I'll send you a copy of that letter that the de delegation had sent as well. Great, and I can you. send a, a copy of the letter that the Senate sent to the entire de mass delegation and administration. So you have that, that was the one that we were put, putting forth the, the HEROES Act because it was so, such a chalk-filled bill. So that, that would be great, but we can send that out to you as well. So you have copies of all. That would be great. That would be really helpful for us. That. Yeah, thank you. I have a copy of that. I wanted the David sent it to me, so I will forward it on to the committee. So okay, great. Uh, I definitely. Yeah, thank you. Does thank anyone you. else from the school committee have a quick question? I just want to be respectful of time. No. Well, again, on behalf of the Hollister School Committee and our Hollister Public Schools family and our students. Thank you both for being such great leaders, and we look forward to our partnership as we move through this crazy pandemic. Thank you. Thank you all Thank you. for your great work. It's great to have great partners in local government, definitely. Yes, thank you. And I hope that all of you continue to stay healthy and well, as well as your families, uh, and have a good summer. Healthy and well. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. If you want, now. Pooja can follow up with the school committee and superintendent for that, for the DESE meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Keeping with the agenda, uh, public comment, Tina? I have no public comment tonight. Thank you. John? Uh, just a few items, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, it's a relatively busy week across the board. Yes. Um, I want to first recognize um, the arrival of Engine 1 yeah. on the fire department. Um, Hopefully, a major piece of equipment, so congratulations on that. Um, I wanted to also briefly talk about some of the activities of the Halston Police Department this past week. Um, speaking to Chief Stone, it was one of the busiest weeks in quite a while for the organization. They underwent and um, achieved uh, accreditation, reaccreditation of their organization. Uh, no major findings, um, and he's quite proud of the work that uh, the staff put into that um, um, process. He's um, on top of that. They um, uh, helped coordinate with the fire chief um, a very successful diverse Halston walk on Friday evening. Um, about 100 people um, took the time to get out and um, make their voices and positions known on racial injustice. Uh, Halston PD, Halston Fire were along to make sure everybody was safe during a very hot evening, as I understand and that went well. Um, and also uh, two new officers have joined our ranks this past uh, week as well. So um, the Halston Police Department was quite busy. They had a very active week. Our community should understand how hard they work for us as well as the fire department. Excellent job by all. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my uh, public comment, I wanted to uh, uh, thank my colleagues, um, all the department heads, uh, our town administrator, our, all the committees in town, um, and all the volunteers uh, for making my uh, last year on the board as, as chair a, uh, uh, a very uh, busy and, and but good year because we got a lot done um, and it, we, we got a lot of business done for our town during a very trying time. And I don't think there's been a chair um, that has had so much on the plate um, as this year with not only the coronavirus, but all the the other things that go with it, like the 112th budget um, and uh, having to postpone uh, the election, town meeting, all the extra work that goes with that. This uh, board is involved with, with everything, and not to mention our town administrator retiring all at the same time and, and having to uh, organize a search committee and a professional firm to help us with that, um, as well as all the regular normal things with uh, legal challenges um, and town business. So it's been an extraordinary year. Uh, for our town, and one that we'll never forget. And I was so lucky to have my two colleagues 
uh, on board uh, because they are exceptional uh, Hall Estonians who love this town and they bring to the table so many skills, some of which I don't have. So I can't thank you enough. It's been a, a pleasure and a team effort. And uh, and so thank you all uh, for for all that you all do, including all the volunteers and and uh, our whole town hall staff and and like I mentioned, all the committees and all the department heads and all of their employees. So thank you. And that's all I have for public comment. Do we have any public comment, Mr. Ritter? I have no public comment. Okay. Do oh, Mrs. Raffi uh, has the public. On behalf of the public schools community and our students and our family and our staff, and from our board, and I too can sympathize with you a little bit on what it's <laughs> like to be a chair during the COVID response with people leaving and just a, a path not shoveled for us yet. You have done it with grace. We appreciate all that you have done. You are a wonderful, recognized community member who has been recognized before for your excellence and your wonderfulness. Thank you. You are an advocate for so many people, and they appreciate it. Your kindness, your gentleness, those are all wonderful qualities that don't ever let anyone tell you they're not. We thank you, and I wish you a very happy time away from being on the select board, but I know you will still be very active in our town. And for that, I thank you, and I congratulate you, and you know I'm giving you a big hug. Thank you, and one right back at you. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyone else with a public comment from the conference? Okay, on we go to our community update from with the coronavirus, our chief Cassidy himself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief because I realize there are many agenda items behind me. Yes. Uh, first of all, an update on our cases. We remain flat. We still have had 56 positive cases uh, reported in Holliston. As of right now, we, are, we know of 51 that have recovered. There have been two COVID-related fatalities, leaving three active cases as we have had for a little while. Uh, the exciting thing that I would like to report more for the public, the board already is aware of this, but uh, as of last Thursday, our $1,317,137 from the Executive Office of Administration and Finance has been received in the town's bank account. Uh, and we also have received uh, a guidance document from uh, DLS, which can allow us to provide the proper guidance to the accountant as to how to set up revenue funds for both the CARES Act as well as for any potential FEMA reimbursement. I had a good uh, initial intake call with the representative who's been assigned to our community to regard our FEMA reimbursement process, so I have some uh, a path forward. I know how we're going to, to manage that because normally when we do a FEMA reimbursement, it's for a specific event. It's a snowstorm that happened for two days in March, and when we do the application, the all the expenses have already been incurred. This is different because it's an ongoing emergency and there right. will still be additional expenses this summer, this fall. Mm. And so they, they gave some uh, guidance as to how we can do certain operational periods and that will not prevent us from, if we apply for March to June, that doesn't prevent us from being able to do a second project for July to September as long as the emergency is still, uh, the, the, major disaster declaration is still in force from the, the federal government. Uh, and then lastly, with regards to the CARES Act and the implementation of that, uh, as I mentioned to the board before, uh, the coordination of reimbursement programs through federal or state uh, is an emergency management function. And so I'm prepared in these coming weeks as we're in a little bit of a transition period between uh, town administrators and chairs of the board uh, to be able to help oversee how that CARES Act is implemented because it's, it's coming right at the tail end of a fiscal year and we've got books that need to be closed as of July 15th, but the guidance documents that we've received from DLS, um, I think we've got a path forward. 
there are really three types of uh, expenses that would be coming under the CARES Act. There are those that have already been incurred and were submitted to me, which is part of the spreadsheet that I had shared with the board when we initially were looking at 150,000 requests, which became a $550,000 request. There were those anticipated expenses, again, which had been built into the spreadsheet, things like what uh, Chairman Raffi mentioned earlier with regards to their technology request of 343,000. Uh, and then there were the future ones that were also incorporated into the, um, the spreadsheet. So there are certain known expenses that we had anticipated as part of our application. The guidance from DLS allows us to use the same categories that were in the Executive Office of Administration and Finance, Attachment A, categories such as direct staffing costs, accelerated telework capacity, PPE, cleaning and disinfecting of public buildings, planning and development including IT, signage and communication, grocery and or meal support, and as uh, had been mentioned at one point, short-term rental or mortgage support. So we can set up in Munis the revenue account and then we can have specific line items that we can create a budget. There can be some uh, notations within Munis to be able to uh, make whole any expenses that were made from general um, accounts and then additional expenses are, as they're incurred can be charged directly to those line items as assigned. And then just the, the administrative and logistic thing we want to make sure that we work out is moving forward as additional expenses are proposed that have not been uh, incorporated into that original spreadsheet, the process by which that request is made, to whom that request is made, um, and how that uh, approval goes forward so that we don't have departments and committees and individual staff members fighting over money thinking that there's only a little bit left. So right, right. But we also don't want a free-for-all because this money does need to not last us until December 30th. Right, right, absolutely. And I I, I can't thank uh, the community enough and this board for choosing to uh, go for the whole uh, allotment that and apply for it with uh, T.O.R. that uh, um, I can really see that we're going to be needing it and it would have been much tougher to do it the other way and ask as you go. So this is, I, th I think, was a very prudent thing to do and I'm glad that folks spoke up and I know Mr. Cronin had a big part to play in that and uh, so thank you, John, and others for supporting it. I think it's going to make our, our lives a lot easier. Um, by by having the, the whole amount up front. It Don't will be part of your enduring legacy because <laughs> it was your signature on the attachment B that went in with our application. Yes, well, I just listened to everybody else and <laughs> and uh, and I I think that it was uh, the right thing to do, and we'll be able to fund things quicker this way too. Yes. So I think that's that's huge in itself. So thank you, sir. Um, any questions? Well, so, yeah, a couple things. Um, since we received notice that we would be uh, granted the full amount, we did receive one additional request, was not on the original um, list that you had compiled. And so moving forward, I'd like to take some time tonight to kind of sketch out how the process will work. And you and I had spoken. Uh, I think it's worth noting that of the 35 or so requests that you received up until the submission, um, about Three quarters of them, about 21 of them, were for less than or about $2,000. And so with that in mind, I think what we ought to consider is allowing our emergency management director to unilaterally approve requests that come in 2000 or less, that amounts that are requested that are above 2000 um, come to before this board for review. I think that's worth considering. I'll point out that we had 484,000 of eligible costs up until the submission. Uh, if we set aside the proposed, and this is just the proposal, 50,000 or so, so 2 to 4 percent of the total amount for a potential mortgage and relief program, um, that leaves $782,000 of the CARES Act money untouched, unaccounted for. So taking in requests for up to $2,000 of eligible costs uh, is, is Low, low hanging fruit. It's, it's not right. um, a huge amount. So I would put that out for the board to consider. Well, we would need to have a motion, I think, on that, wouldn't we? Uh, 
Let's have a chat first, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean the chat, but I mean I think. For sure. I yeah. Think I think where gonna, we're going is a vote. Yeah. You think you're going to do? You have that. to direct them. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that uh, again, requests over 2,000 ought to come before this board for consideration, mostly because we haven't seen many requests for over 2,000. So they would be significant and unique were they to be greater than 2,000. Um, I think that we should uh, consider having our emergency management director verify eligibility, gather compliance documents, and coordinate with the town accountant to disperse funds accordingly. Mm -hmm. And that periodically our emergency management director would update the board on where we are with compliance documents and also um, where we are with the remaining balance. I will point out we don't yet have the compliance report, what needs to be submitted to the state. We don't yet have that in hand, so I would preface all of that by saying until we have that document, this is probably just a, these are just suggestions. We are building the plane as we fly it. Yeah, pretty much. And, and, um, I, think, and I think we said that. The request would come into the town administrator, if I remember well, correctly. Well, th so this is all until July 12th. Right. This is sort of our interim plan until we have a town administrator. We are seeing requests come in. Okay. So I think we have to have a plan until then. Okay. I, okay. I absolutely would envision we revisit that plan um, on July 12th or thereabouts, but this would be uh, sort of the, again, interim plan. Um, in terms of the mortgage and rent relief proposal, that's just what it is. Uh, Youth and Family Services Director is working on it with the director of the Community Action Fund, um, and we should be hearing from them soon uh, to see if we are going to move forward in that direction. And then my question would be whether or not, my direct question would be whether or not we need a motion tonight to create the two COVID-19 emergency fund accounts that are in the bulletin, in the guidance from DLS. Do we need a, a motion to direct the town accountant to do that, or is that something that um, could move forward without a motion? She creates accounts all the time. Right, so this is that makes sense. It's up for discussion. John? So um, I was thinking along the exact same lines that Tina was talking. Um, I think given that the Ritter's transition, he, he needs to get um, prepared to um, turn the, his office and all the other projects over to Mr. O'Hearn. Um, it would be in our best interest to allow the emergency director in his stead until Travis arrives to coordinate uh, the CARES Act uh, processes. Um, Tina, with all respect, I, I don't see any distinction on the $2,000 level. I, okay. You know, I, I envision, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, he appears before us weekly. Um, he gives us reports on the status of the health condition of the community. And I think if he were to come in with a weekly manifest, if you will, of uh, new projects that are entering for consideration, um, as well as uh, planned expenditures, we can sign off on, on an inventory of any costs. I think okay. it should come through us for a vote uh, to be executed by the CEO of the town through uh, the chief during this time period. Um, I'd like to see everything. It's a, It's kind of a... To me, it's it's similar to any other warrant item we look at. We look at it, details all the time. Well, it's it's a really good transparent way to you yeah. know the residents will have this report and sign off uh, weekly, and right. so they'll know what's going on. But uh, I think once you oil up the machine, it should be relatively seamless. I think people will understand how to get their requests in, have it filtered, um, and then bring it before us. We get it approved, and you move on. So I. That's how I see it, Tina. I, mean, just, I okay. think delegating a three a two thousand dollar level would be typical if this was more of a sustainable program. Okay. This has a six month half life, so. Okay. I'd like Good to see the that. project come in and out. Yeah, no, I'm happy to have a framework and. Okay. Um, I'm I'll take a motion. Do you want me to make the motion? Yes, sure. Go ahead. So I'd like to direct the emergency director of uh, Town Halston <laughs> to provide the uh, select board with weekly um, expenditure requests associated with the CARES Act application. Um, as well as any new items that are being proposed by uh, stakeholders within the CARES Act community so that we can evaluate those for entry into the program. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Aye. You're staring at me like I forgot something. So I, 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 you completed your vote, right? Yeah. Yes. I, I just, I'm looking for guidance. So anything that was already included in the spreadsheet, can we roll that out without authorization? Further authorization? Yes. Now you're just sending it in as an expenditure you. request. Absolutely. Yeah, you got it. To, yep. Great. And was there a second motion you said? Well, I just, uh, so for the board to, to discuss whether or not we need a motion to direct the town accountant to create these in, uh, two funds in accordance with DLS guidance. So moved. I believe you need that. I will amend my motion to include the direction for the town accountant to set up the uh, revenue accounts as directed by uh, the state. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you much. Much Thanks. appreciated. Oh, is there any questions for our our director of emergency? 
Yes, Anne Louise. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. So I just want to make sure I'm like abundantly clear on process moving forward. Um, especially since our requests are typically more than 2000, but I understand you just voted not to have a threshold. Um, so is it, is it going to be just like as the costs come up that we submit them or is there, and, and do we go directly to Chief Cassidy and um, Mr. Ahern or who do we submit the request to and what's the process from there in the course of a week? Like, I understand Mr. Ahern and Chief Cassidy may be coming before you on a weekly basis, but can we expect that if we submit something on a Wednesday, it'll show up the following Monday on your approval agenda? I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could issue a procedural memo to all departments so that it's very clear on how this actually works. Absolutely, I, I'd be happy to prepare some guidance like that. And just a reminder, Anne Louise, uh, there was quite a few items that were in my spreadsheet prior to our CARES Act application. So it, it will probably be a little while before you need to come and ask for anything extra. You're, 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 right. you're, very, well, you're, you're very well positioned because in addition to the 343,000 for technology, the business manager had also built in PPE, sanitation, and other uh, sanitizing, I should say, uh, costs with, with my spreadsheet. So yeah. you should be good for a little bit. No, 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 we, we are. And I, and I actually want to um, point out that's because we actually began planning about the third week of March on how to deal with all of this, despite the uncertainty. So I'm really glad we were able to provide you with a pretty comprehensive um, assessment of needs. And actually, the one piece I'm still wondering about now that Senator Spilka and Representative Dykema updated us on the um, IT bond and uh, well, the transportation thing's a little more vague. Um, it it looks like there may be another avenue to get some support. So I guess that's for the technology piece. And look, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. And and you've already we're so far down the path with the CARES Act. But I also don't want to miss the opportunity to take advantage of another resource if the town can benefit from that. So I'm wondering um, if there's a way for us to kind of regroup with um, maybe Pooja on this to very quickly assess, like, is that where some of that technology should have gone or should be going? Uh, Stacy. Stacy, go ahead. So I just wanted to make the recommendation possibly maybe uh, Chief Cassidy attend the next budget subcommittee meeting um, with Tina there and you guys can talk about the process and procedure because I think some people might not be prepared to fully create a process on <laughs> hand. And just to be clear, I'm not asking for that tonight. I mean, I was asking for a, um, a procedural memo, which obviously you're not going to draft tonight, but I think it's really important to clarify that. And no, we're not asking for anything tomorrow. Um, but sure, Chief Cassidy, join the party. It's a real seven. Nine people on this call right now, so go for it. And and, and Louise, the the guidance that came out from uh, DLS did talk about the way that if there's more than one funding source, we can assign it in one account in anticipation of funding coming from somewhere else. So if it looks like some of the $343,000 technology uh, expenses might be eligible for that 50-50 match uh, through the, the other grant program that's yet to be <coughs> passed by the legislature, then uh, we, we can park it in one account for now. And if we need to peel 50% of that off and assign it to a different grant account to be created in Munis, uh, those are all things that we can do on the back end. Yeah. Okay, so those are options on the back end. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Um, okay. So you work up a memo. Great. Thank you. And our, all our right. meeting is at 10 a.m. So um, we will send you an invite for Tuesday, for Wednesday at 10 if you would like to join us, Chief Cassidy. I and would if be you honored. Don't to, that's okay. Too. Thank you, Chief. Much appreciated as yeah. always. And we have some warrants. 
We do indeed. Tonight's warrant is for $718,006.22, of which the town payroll is $180,033.84. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Report of the town administrator. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Jeff. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, uh, just a couple of updates here from our facilities manager, uh, James Keast. James Keast. Uh, he said that the, uh, the doors at Pinecrest will be installed next week. So that's been a long project that's been in the works for a long time. And uh, we see the end of that by the end of next week. Excellent. The main the main room in Pinecrest has been repainted, and it's all done, and uh, everyone is happy about the colors. We've consulted with the golf course uh, advisory committee, and they've been on board, and uh, it's all it's all done. Also, Excellent. Uh, the uh, snack shack uh, renovations have been completed, and uh, an update on the 260 Woodland Street uh, project. Uh, that will be completed next uh, Wednesday or Thursday week. And um, the uh, barriers that are scheduled to be installed at Town Hall uh, to protect our bees from the virus uh, are scheduled to be uh, completed by uh, September 24th, which is uh, next Wednesday, I think it is. And it'll take about one day to have that completed. Um, also, just wanted to um, reiterate that uh, we are scheduling. Jeff, I think the date is um, June 24th. June 24th is when the barriers will be installed. Yes. You had said September, so I just want I'm, I'm sorry. June 20th. Okay. June 24th. Um, and it'll take about one day for that to be installed. Excellent. Is that it, on, on your future agenda on, on uh, June 30th, we're looking at having a public discussion on the Lowland Industrial Park. Okay, okay. so uh, the, I know the police chief has created a letter to go out to all the abutters about that, and um, it will be on your agenda. I think it's at 715 to have any input on, you know, what the truck routes are, are looking, looking like. Um, I just wanted to give up. 29th. June 29th. Is that next Monday, Jeff? June uh, 29th. I think it's the 30th. Tuesday. Days. Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. So we're meeting Monday and Tuesday next week. So you're posting for both Monday and Tuesday. And that was the plan, unless you want me to do it. Well, uh, I think notice is going out to the about uh, you know to the uh, community on the 30th. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. Yep. I think it's going to be a, a little bit of a protracted discussion, so I think you might want to have some time to really noodle on okay. that. But I just want to give a public thanks uh, and appreciation to our superintendent of schools, Brad Jackson, um, who has been a integral partner with me over my five years plus uh, tenure. Uh, we've met monthly over the past five years to exchange ideas and information and uh, it's been very, 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 very helpful. Uh, and I wanted to just publicly thank Brad for his, you know, participation in that and his, um, his guidance um, for that. Finally, I just wanted to thank uh, our chairman, um, Mark Aronian, um, who has been a partner and who has been a, uh, a sound uh, sage uh, for um, giving me guidance over the past five years. Um, I think he, Mike, Mark is uh, an extraordinary individual and uh, I really uh, will miss him and appreciate his guidance over the years. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jeff, much appreciated. And as you know, I um, thoroughly enjoyed working with you on so many important matters and uh, much appreciated all that you you did for the town. Um, any questions for the town administrator? Yes, 
just I'll, I'll jump on Jeff's time here to make an announcement I should have made under public, public comment, which is um, Halston uh, Household Hazardous Waste Day is Saturday, June 11th, 2020. Uh, it'll be from 9 to noon at the Adams Middle School down on Woodland Street. So again, our June, Hazardous Waste Day. Yes. June 11th. July. July. Good Lord. We're all missing up our, our months today. <laughs> Jeff, it's contagious. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> Halston Household Hazardous Waste Day, Saturday, July 11th, 2020, from 9 to 12 at right. the Adams Middle School. Thank you. No problem. John, any questions? For no, not Jeff? at the time. Jeff, thanks a million. Uh, and do we have any questions from the conference call for our town administrator? Stacy, anything? Jeff, I just, it, it, this is not his last meeting, right? No. Oh, never mind. I'll save my comments till next week. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, take a five-minute break, and then when we get back, we're going to start with the water rate study with our <clears throat> director, Sean Reese. Okay? Five-minute break. Yes, I yep. do. All right. Chris, I'm muted over there. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Welcome, Welcome back, you. and we will continue on with our meeting here on June 22nd. And we have our DPW director Sean Reese with us to talk about our water rate study. Sean, floor is yours. All right, thank you. All right, so today is my first opportunity to discuss the water rate study with Stantec today at 2 o'clock, okay? So it's a tremendous amount of information. Uh, what I propose in speaking with John is we have a meeting again with the consultant on this coming Wednesday to kind of go over the data a little bit further, make some decisions as far as some additional modeling and how to uh, disseminate the information out to uh, yourselves and the public. So, um, my request would be to postpone the water rate hearing until next Monday. Okay. Okay. I think we'll better have a better handle on uh, okay. what we want to do with it going forward and have a better presentation. Okay. Okay. Sean, so the task of the water rate hearing was put to Stantec this past spring, is that right? Correct. Uh, sometime in April or March? Um, somewhere around there, I believe. The annual process, they prepare the uh, water rate information for us. Um, this year, the timing was coincidental to the COVID-19 emergency. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, as soon as we started uh, kind of doing some data sharing, um, that's kind of when that whole pandemic kind of started for us. All right. We... Um, the, the the view I have is that the, the water rate hearing is integral, obviously, to the future planning of um, uh, water infrastructure mm -hmm. and costs associated with it. Mm -hmm. I think our board has had an interest in the uh, the details behind it as you've accumulated a certain balance in your retained earnings account and so forth. And uh, we want to make sure that the residents aren't paying more for water uh, to accumulate large surpluses than they should be. So uh, to the extent that you need more time to look at the details, I would also encourage any data associated with that uh, report to be put up on our website so residents can look into the water rate data. I know it's dense. Um, perhaps you can speak to Stantec about bringing forth a model that they could understand before next week's hearing. Okay. That's possible. I think that would be very beneficial. Okay. Any questions, Tim? No, I mean, I, I think I'll take this opportunity to say what I've, I believe I've said before at one of our meetings. I am definitely interested to see what the water rate study has to say on removing the cap, the tier three cap on businesses. Um, we don't have to discuss it tonight, but I thought I'd just bring that up again as something that I'll be looking to understand a lot more about. Um, I think that's something the town should consider given the needs uh, for conservation and efficient water use and so on. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing that information. Okay. On I, Monday. I can tell you initially, I mean, uh, I mean, their modeling is based on 
uh, our current rates and trajectory out for 10 years, so they did a, a 10 year financial model. Um, as far as moving the one tier to tier to three, tier four, be, I think that'd be more of a, uh, um, I don't think it would greatly impact the 10 year model, to be honest with you. Okay. But Wednesday, I'll make sure that we cover that so I have a better explanation for you. Okay. Okay, so if I'm hearing this correct, Donna, we need our next Monday night's agenda, both the water rate study and the water rate hearing. Okay. I'm presuming, by the way, that that's not an impactful decision given the fact that your chair will move to another member. Um, right. I think as long as we have an open hearing, we can conduct our business. Absolutely. Unless Mr. Ritter or somebody else feels differently, let us know. That would be my understanding. All right. Next water treatment plant, Mr. Reese. Okay. All right. So we are moving forward with the treatment plant. Um, we have posted a new project timeline and some project information on the town's website, so I'll be better at that as far as regular posting and regular information shared with the board. Okay. Uh, our last meeting was on May 20th. Uh, right now the uh, design and specifications are at 60%. Our next steps are uh, to meet with uh, building inspectors, town planner, board of health, um, the inclusion of any of the water department comments and others incorporated into our design. Uh, we have a, a permit package to the Conservation Commission, Halston Planning Board, Board of Health, and the EPA. We need to do, dig two test pits down there for septic. Um, and continue towards the completion of design, which is expected to be 2020, October of 2020. So this coming October will be 100% design. The bidding uh, phase and contract award will start in November of 2020 and continue through February of 21. We should have construction starting uh, this coming spring in 2021 and our completion timeline is summer of 22. Um, we're continuing to work with MassDEP. Right now, as far as financing, uh, the plan is for Holliston to refile for the SRF in the amount of $8.375 million. The deadline to do that is October 14th of this year. So. I think it's August. August. Pardon? Oh my God! It's, it's, it's contagious. August 14th. <laughs> <laughs> August 14th is the deadline to do that. So we're on track to do that. Um, do we have a backup plan? Should we get turned down again? Because this is very important that this gets underway. It, right. We do. Uh, we, we've had discussions with Mary, John, and I. Um, we will loop the finance committee in. Uh, so there are, there are contingency plans. Now, there's no guarantee that you get the SRF. We they put out the solicitations. We apply, um, and based on the strength of our application and other communities, you may or may not be uh, awarded that type of funding. So in order for us to proceed with our bidding, uh, there's some some uh, some type of municipal government borrowing that we're allowed to do. I don't know the exact details of what the term is, but we can kind of move forward with the bidding. Um, and then if we we do not receive the SRF, then we'll have to go out to a conventional borrowing. Okay, yeah. Or a combination of retained earnings, whatever the town um, deems okay. it. Won't, it's not going to delay uh, good, good. the project. How many months later are you saying the project's going to be finished than what we originally said? Well, my original estimation would have been uh, November of 21, but due to uh, some hiccups as far as the financing and the timing of our design and our completion of designs and specs, it kind of pushed us out to the September, summer of 22. So six months or so? Yes. Okay. Well, we we got to make sure we don't get any more for We're making every effort to kind of commit to yeah. I mean, I don't want to say, you know, but yeah. at the latest summer of 22. Okay. Hopefully we can get the construction done. Soon. All right. 
the, 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 uh, the good news associated with this timeline that Mr. Reese is talking about is it's now locked in contractually. Um, the design contract was signed last October, and it is a 12-month contract. Um, the consultant working on the design has indicated that uh, he must, through contractual obligations, be 100% completion by October of 21, and then the, the, the sequence that follows is all well within our control. Okay. The time frame that gets a little hairy is upcoming this summer as um, the consultant starts to engage in certain regulatory oversight board approvals for the design. Um, that's both mostly state but some local. Um, he doesn't expect too many problems with it, um, but nevertheless, it could add to some of the challenges of being 100% complete. That's why he built in some buffer time. Um, the construction time frame, as Mr. Reese indicated, is also a pretty hard time, time frame. It's um, between 12 and 15 months, right? And uh, excuse me, 15 and 18 months, um, and that will be hardwired into the bid when it is uh, awarded sometime in early March. Um, the uh, the, I, I, I think if I had to look back on one of the reasons why the project has slid about six months has something to do with the timing of the project on the front end <clears throat> where the town appropriated the money. Um, Mr. Reese applied for the state revolving fund that summer of 19, excuse me, of 18, but uh, the state indicated they were looking for a strong design and shovel-ready project. So things paused at that point. We got the design money in the spring of 2019, uh, 600,000, um, and that sort of set in motion this new timeline. Um, one of the takeaways I think from this project and this exercise is that although Mr. Reese does a great job, he's got a lot going on. It's important that for a project like this, citizens and people who are you know so seriously interested in the project understand um, how the project moves and breathes. Um, when we met last week, I observed that. The last update on this project was um, about a year ago, so we're going to be posting those updates more frequently. Um, and I would I would indicate, as your design team achieves certain milestones, that you post those, Sean, Correct. and make it clear that pe to people where we are at in a certain stage of this project. And thank you, John, for doing a great job as the liaison on this. Uh, we we need we need we needed to tighten it up, and it, and it is getting tightened. Yeah, up. we do a lot of different projects, and John certainly. Uh, uh, assist with all of those at this time. A nice job if you'll let the highway department know um, on Ashland Street. That came out really nice. Good. New paving. Well, Cedar Street comes out the same way. And I know that, that the residents appreciate it. And Sean, could I just ask that when you complete the application for the SRF, you notify the board? So given the senator and the representative's comments, we can let them, their offices know? Yes. And uh, hopefully they would be willing to draft a letter of support for our, our application. Yes. I spoke to the SRF folks today. The, the uh, solicitation is still not posted, so you still, right. but uh, within the next week or so, it should be available. And uh, we will apply. And we also have, uh, so we'll give them our 60% design. We have until October, uh, the end of October, to present even uh, greater detailed design, which we will. Okay. Great. Now, Any questions? What, one, one point on that uh, application, which we learned, is the application you opened in 2018 never closed. Right. right. Um, so a refiling. So we are we are in a position, if you will, within uh, state to enter this program. What is the interest rate on um, the state revolving fund? Were we to um, two percent? Two percent for 20 years. Up to right. 20 years. So we're still going to borrow the. Or apply for the 8.375. Now that doesn't mean. So if the project hopefully comes in lower than that, that's what we actually need to borrow is a lower amount. We're permitted to do that. We need to borrow the full amount that we apply for. Okay. Yes. Um, one one caveat to that: the 600,000 that was approved in the May 2019 town meeting for the design actually came in about $100,000 below budget. Okay. So that that savings will be realized in the project when it's done. Great. Any questions from the conference call? Does anyone have a question for our director? Mary Bousquet wants to say something. Mary Bousquet. No, um, I, I'm fine. I was just listening in case you had any questions about the financing. Okay. Mary, can you confirm that the borrowing rate that Tina asked is 2% on it's the 2%, SRF? Uh, 
It's 2% on the bonded amount on the interim loans. It's 0% interest. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean, very much. And again, we'll provide, uh, I'll be back in front of the board to uh, give the updates the next meeting we have, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Yes, you Thanks, got it. Thank, thank you. you. See you next week. I won't, but they will. <laughs> You're always around, Mark. <laughs> All right, Chief, come on up. Uh, annual town meeting date. I asked the Chief to do some research for us, uh, which he will share. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, at uh, the Chair's request, I looked into some of the neighboring towns and what their experience has been with holding their delayed annual town meeting. Uh, some have already held their meeting, such as Ashland and Medway, uh, Natick, Southborough, there are others who were being held tonight or between now and the end of the month. Uh, most of them held them at their school. Uh, there were two uh, in that list that have uh, opted to do the outside model. Um, and uh, the question specifically that the chair had asked me to look into was uh, Hopkinton's, which was scheduled for this evening and has been subsequently re rescheduled. Uh, to a date likely in September. Uh, and when I checked with my counterpart in Hopkinton, he indicated that the reason for that was driven by their concerns about physical distancing in the, the location where the meeting was to be held. So they, um, they were concerned about the constraints that were imposed on, on them by fixed seating and how many they could get into the room. And uh, so it was more of a logistics issue uh, as it pertained to the guidelines and the constraints as they exist in this current phase and not related to questions about like what we heard from the Senate president and our representative, uh, the numbers from the state coming in. So it was, it was more of a logistics and public health, uh, trying to minimize exposure and flow path for people walking uh, than it was related to financial information. Did they feel as though it was going to be safer in September? Is that why they? Uh, they, were, they were hopeful that some of the restrictions might be loosened. Uh, I, yeah. I know that... Maybe phase uh, four by then. Or... Well, I don't know it will be in phase four, but there is some question as to whether or not the six-foot rule might be, restri might be lightened yeah. or um, that would certainly help in terms of your... Uh, ability to place people in a confined space. Right. right. Okay. Cool. So as as it uh, pertains to uh, our annual town meeting, obviously we we have multiple options. We've got uh, the fixed seating option of the high school. Uh, we have a more uh, fluid option of we could set up chairs in the cafetorium at Placentino Miller, and we historically we have held uh, town meetings there, uh, and that would allow us to set up chairs, we can set up individual chairs, we can set up blocks of two chairs for a, you know, a, parts of a family that might come together, we could set up banks of three chairs, all while maintaining the physical distancing requirements within the room, but still allow us to meet uh, and exceed the, the minimum number that we would need for a quorum. Uh, that, and that all, those chairs would be a lot easier for us to disinfect and sanitize afterwards. Right, right. The challenge of the fixed seating in the high school auditorium is that uh, oh. they're upholstery. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. the cleaning of that is going to be, and sanitizing is going to be a little bit more cumbersome. Right. And, and then, expensive, too, I think. But we've got the fogger, so um, yeah. it's just it's, it's man hours. Right. Um, and then the Bellingham taking place this evening on their athletic fields, and uh, earlier this month, uh, Southboro took place on their athletic field, so we, we've got an outside option, but outside um, option and a date <coughs> to be determined by the, the board, and I know one of the considerations, as I've been chatting with our colleagues up the street um, who are trying to plan a graduation ceremony outdoors this summer, um, the heat, the heat um, absolutely. So yeah. those are all sorts of things that your board is going to have to take into consideration when it uh, decides the specific date that you would definitely have it, and then we can get into pros and cons of different facilities, indoor, outdoor, uh, and once we know that, we can help finalize the plan in terms of path of people in, path of people out, how do people access to the uh, microphone if they wish to speak and be heard on an article, 
Um, all of those, yeah, we, we, we can get into those once we uh, we know exactly what we're looking at in terms of what the board prefers. We've got options, and you know, my hope was that once we get through tomorrow, the local election, that uh, you know, members of, of the board who get to, to set the date would uh, be able to confer with the town clerk, myself, the moderator, and uh, we can can agree on what's going to work best for our constituency because um, you know some of these communities and outdoor. Uh, might have been good for their demographic, but if you look at who comes to our uh, town meeting, some of them might not feel that they could uh, stay outside for that long yeah, yeah, for a meeting, yeah, and yeah. they might feel that they were, would be withering away. So, right, right. Um, at least if it's indoors, we can try and focus on uh, environmental controls with regard right. to the HVAC. Right. But again, the, the decision as to when it's going to be held uh, rests with your board, and I will support you and can give you best practices from whatever communities are out there, uh, lessons learned of those that have already done it, and uh, just make sure that we're going to do it in a safe manner. Okay. Tina? Uh, just a couple things. First, we, we have set the date as July 20th, so when you refer to a changing date, that would be a future decision the board has not yet made. Currently, it's set for July 20th. Um, I very much like the idea of sharing expectations with the community as to how what coming into town meeting, what it might look like, what it might feel like, regardless of where and when. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, the things like bring your mask and be prepared to, uh, would you think, I mean, tell me I'm way off the track here, would you think of people registering, you mentioned seating, yep. uh, flexible seating where you'd have twos or threes or whatever based on the people coming together from a family. That sounds like you've identified, they've registered beforehand to tell you that, you know, you're going to want to set it up because I'm bringing me and my, my husband of 55 years. Um, is that what you're thinking? Uh, that, that's a, a possibility. I know that that's uh, similar to the guidance from the uh, Education Commissioner with regards to outdoor graduation ceremonies, that you have to pre-register who's going to be coming. So possibility of pre-registration. It, it, it is a possibility for okay. pre-registration. Yeah. Um, and then what you're talking about, if I hear you right, is Holliston High School Auditorium versus maybe the elementary school versus maybe a field. Those are sort of the three that are floating in your head. Uh, I, I, I didn't think that us going to an an out-of-town location which was permitted by some of the legislation and the emergency uh, executive orders. I didn't think that that was a be uh, the best option. So that's not available? I was just going to say, it's a place in Foxville. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And then, uh, so if we sort of, sounds like narrowed it down at least this point in time to those three locations, do any of those venues that you have in your mind um, pose an issue with a quorum of 100 because I think that's something this board needs to track very closely is if we I don't think we're there right. but if we in any way shape or form needed to see a smaller quorum in order to fit the venue with all the safety protocols in place that's something right. we need to act on quickly but I don't see that being a, an issue no we, so. we, we, we could easily fit a hundred in the auditorium even by the, the challenge of the auditorium would be how you block off seats to tell people you can't sit there. Um, Angry people yelling? That's, that, that's really not uh, what I'm looking forward to for the uh, the, the town meeting. You've never been to some meet then? Uh, no, um, no, I have not. Um, well, so do you see them having to cap attendance? Ooh, I, that's I, tough. I, I, we, in my experience, we've never had to do that. We've had overflow seating uh, that was... Uh, required, but I, I can't anticipate us uh, taking the ability of someone to participate in uh, our open town meeting away from them, even under this public health emergency. The only reason that I would suggest they, that it, they can't come in is if they uh, have symptoms and for public health reasons we need to exclude them. But, um, so both, both locations would allow us to, to meet or exceed the 100 quorum that we normally have. Okay. I I would not have been if if I had to if if I were asked to commit this evening, I would not be recommending to the board to lower your court. Okay. All right. I'm just concerned then about capacity, um, because that's obviously how we maintain much of what we want to protect with public health sure. is by not having people crowd in. And so, you, obviously, the answer is not here tonight in this room, but that'll be something I'm very curious as to how we manage that. And maybe it's just simply sharing expectations like we did with vote by mail. Right. You know, we sort of set out there that this is what it's going to look and feel like and, and sort of plan accordingly. Uh, I don't know, though, how that... Including is if... If your whole family normally participates, perhaps this is the meeting where only one member of your 
family need to come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of baselining, okay. that messaging. John. Bill Setti? Yes, thank Does you. Does the remote participation option enter the picture here? No, not for us. Not on the current guidelines. No, not the current guidelines. So if it were at the high school in the auditorium, having an overflow in the cafeteria would not be an option? That's considered remote, correct? Uh, no, that would not be remote. I okay. thought you were referring to like the use of the Zoom technology. No, no. No, so, so an, another room with concurrent participation is allowable, and there just has to be um, a means by which the moderator can see that someone wishes to be recognized and that the individuals in that overflow room see and hear and can speak when, when recognized. Mm -hmm. um, so that is allowable, and, and so both. That could be very helpful. Yes, I mean, it, it's cumbersome and there, there's more logistics to the setup, but again, it's not anything that we haven't done before. We've, we've, we've done overflow at the mm -hmm. while, but yeah, that's right. Um, I, I've seen older emails from the town moderator who up to now has been exceedingly accommodating. Have you had any discussion with him about I I passed on all the guidance to him, and he acknowledges receipt of it each time. And it, right. it has been a, we need to let the town clerk get through the local election mm -hmm. before she can wrap her brain around right. what a annual town meeting would look like. One of the issues that um, I'm kind of minding here, here is that a July town meeting, if we pull it off, Three months later, we're at it again. Um, do you happen to know if the special act that allows us to extend town meeting includes a fall town meeting? Can we move a, that a town meeting? fall town meeting would normally be referred to as a special That's town meeting. Correct. And I have heard of at least one community in our region that is combining both of theirs into one. And they're, they're conducting the business in the fall that they would normally do in the fall and they have pushed their annual to the fall concurrently. Um, so the legislation doesn't preclude you. You, again, need to have a reason, and there is a mechanism by which you can continue to push and off the date, um, and that's within your purview. Um, so the, the legislation doesn't um, eliminate your option to, to do that. That's important to know because it was, as we kind of cast our eye towards what will happen financially, but there's a public health unknown as some experts are now, you know, opining that there may be more to this um, with the younger people down the road or a second wave and so forth. And uh, having the flexibility to move October, if it's necessary, is, is, is good to know. Um, the, from a pr public health perspective, you, you informed this board last week that the uh, community spread is alive and well. We are in that space. Um, we are trending pretty well in our numbers. We don't see any uptick in public mm -hmm. health. Um, cases involving coronavirus. Um, we seem to have things under control. In addition to the steps that you indicated in this time that you would take to space out the chairs in a public space, um, can you let citizens know a little bit more about the experience they could ex expect to see? I saw in the guidance, for example, Chief, that there are some um, recommendations regarding aisles, uh, movement within the town meeting, um, speakers, excuse me, the the microphones, the constant cleaning. Can you give people an idea of what that expectation that I think Ms. Hine was looking for is? Sure, and, and that would be uh, even just the user experience would be very similar to what anyone who physically goes to vote tomorrow would look like. There would be clear um, aisles for entry, which are going to be separate from exit. Uh, there would be aisles and, and uh, pathways by which people would be able to go to a microphone and someone would need to be tasked to wiping that down with um, a alcohol-based wipe after each use. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was uh, recommending to the um, school official today when we were talking about logistics for a, a high school graduation was that if you've got, if you anticipate multiple speakers in close proximity, to actually have multiple microphones set up and sort of just, just yeah. you know, sequence it so that. If you you know you can go up to microphone number one, you can go up to number microphone number three, you can go to microphone number five, so that the other ones can be being disinfected before their their use again. Right. Um, yeah, and and you and the consideration of what if someone needs to get up and use the restroom, and so there needs to be a path by which people understand you need to only walk in certain areas, even though it looks like 
the path of least resistance, the shortest distance between two points, but right. due to the concerns about um, you know, the virus and the, the spread that you would need to understand that you might need to walk a few more steps than you normally would. This board's taken some steps to try and make the warrant um, as reasonable as possible. Um, we're currently sitting at 27 articles, I believe. Um, there may be further trimming to that before we, and if we get to our next town meeting. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing that many people will be informed as we approach the town meeting about their personal experience. You and I swapped some emails as I saw. Southboro, I thought, did a nice job yes. with a, a, a website post of your, your town meeting experience, mm -hmm. what you're likely to encounter. Um, we, we want people to attend, but we want to do it safely and obviously with some level of brevity so that you know we can move on with our business um, and get it done when it's done. Right. Um, so I would encourage us to begin doing something similar, Mike. I, I strongly believe in public notification, something that gives them a clear understanding of what to expect. Right. Yep. And, and there are a lot of best cases. Southboro did an excellent job, I would agree. There are a couple other communities that have done a nice job of, of baselining people's expectations mm -hmm. so that they know what it will look and feel like and whether they're a first-time town meeting attendee and they don't know what it's looked like before, or whether they've been a long-term, long-time town meeting attendee, and this is going to be very different from anything we've ever experienced. But yes, I agree. Communication is key, and just like uh, the DPW director is going to be giving frequent project updates, I, I am happy to, as we develop these plans, to um, to start to publicize them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your report. Absolutely. Much appreciated. <clears throat> Annual town meeting warrant and school committee capital requests. So, uh, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff. Yeah. Um, I just want to have some clarification. Um, the board has not made any decision yet about delaying town meeting. Uh, we're on schedule for July 20th. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. So in terms of the warrant, uh, well, first of all, uh, the school committee has requested a delay of any discussion on their capital um, request until next week. Right. So that'll be on the agenda next week. That's correct. Yep. Um, so on in terms of the warrant as currently yeah. presented, as of Friday, uh, June 19th, 2020, um, I just want to clarify or bring to the attention of the board that the articles in the current warrant as drafted needs to be ordered um, if you choose to order them or they're going to stay the way they are. I just want to let you know that. Go ahead, John. Jeff, do we have all the answers back from council on the various articles that we'd um, put forth to her? Uh, some of them we do, some of them we do not. Uh, article um, five is the uh, consolidated personnel bylaw. I'm not sure if Mary is still on there or not, but uh, um, I've um, incorporated her changes into that. We lost him, Jeff. Yeah. There you are. Huh? We lost you again, Jeff. I wonder what happened. I don't think Mary's on the call, by the way. Hmm? I don't think Mary's on the call. Jeff? I'm into that article, so. Um, Jeff, we didn't hear you. Can you repeat that, please? Article five. Oh, did you press the mute by accident? Mute button. Did you press the mute button? No, here, here yeah. I am. Okay. Can you talk about yeah. Article five again? Yeah. Um, article thirteen was the uh, report of the Community Preservation Committee. John noted last week that the total was not correct. I made that a. Yeah of $661,000. Okay, so article... But Jeff, article, can you repeat article five? Because we, we lost you that time. All right, uh, article five. Uh, these are the uh, corrections that Mary had provided to me. 
and um, I've cut and pasted them into the warrant. And uh, unless Mary is present uh, at the moment, um, these adjustments. Okay. Can you read those adjustments for us? I don't have the detailed uh, adjustments to that. If you want me to get okay. a headline version of that, I can do that for Mary. Okay. Um, so, Mark, I had a look at I had a look at Article Five. Okay. Uh, just to understand from the earlier versions of the warrant, from even before the pandemic really took over, what it appears to me that it represents is uh, just simply zero percent. So there are no wage changes. Um, it looks like the manage the um, classification system remains unchanged. Um, so the grades and so on, and the managerial grades are unchanged. It's just that the FY20 is carried over to be FY21. No change in any of the salary grades is how I read it. Is, do you concur with that, Jeff? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Anything? Which is consistent with our other department budgets and, and salaries. Do you Correct. have any other articles you want to talk about? Um, I just want to draw your attention again to Article 13, the report of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, yeah. John had noted that the total was not correct. It's been correct now to reflect a $661,000 appropriation. Okay. Okay, Question so John. Article Art, Article 14 is the capital expenditures um, budget. And um, I think I reflected what the board wanted. And that's uh, $125,000 for the Miller's school roof project, um, yeah. 1550 Washington Street, $8,600, uh, senior center improvements at $12,000, water, uh, wastewater treatment plant evaluation repairs at $54,500, and radio operability improvements at $283,020 for a total of $483,120. So I think that it reflects what the current board thinking is at the moment. Uh, as you know, um, you're gonna be meeting with the school committee next week and about some of their capital expenditures and uh, uh, well, that number could obviously could change. Questions, Tina? Uh, I, I had questions about article 16 and 22. Um, we've not had any uh, discussion before the board on either of these two articles, so it's, they're both in, uh, sponsored by the select board. At this point, I am not comfortable um, voting to include them in the warrant, with, again, without any discussion. So I don't know if it's possible to line up uh, somebody to present the need for Article 16 and Article 22. It's not so much that I question the need. They do look a little redundant, but I, I, I won't pretend to um, yeah, make comment about that. But if, if we can't get someone to present on the information, I, I'm uncomfortable including them in the warrant uh, simply because I couldn't stand up at town meeting and discuss them. So, John, uh, your, your, your feelings on this? I concur. Okay. Do we want to strike them or do we want to wait another week? Um, I would just say that you know, these are both um, select board articles, Article 16, except Hopping Brook Road and Boynton Road. Um, I think that these um, are an Article 22 retroactive road acceptances. Uh, Article 22 especially um, has already been through the board, but was never accepted by town meeting. So there was a public hearing about this article 22 probably 20 years ago or 15 years ago and um, uh, was never really um, shouldn't we have somebody on the planning board reporting about this sure uh, can you arrange that for next week I can do that absolutely that would be good yep can do that thank you yep um, I just want to draw your attention to Article 21. Um, the, the wording has been adjusted a little bit, and the title is going to be adjusted a little bit. Um, the, the title 
currently says Middlesex County Retirement System Stabilization Fund. Um, I, th I think based on input from our town accountant and our town treasurer, um, the title of the article is going to be Stabilization Fund slash Pension Liability. Um, so just, just so you know um, that that adjustment is coming forward. And that's have, I think, uh, for the update on the warrant. Uh, oh, Article 26. Um, electric aggregation revenue to fund sustainability coordinator position. So the town will vote to approve the allocation and appropriation of a one, uh, 0.1 and kilowatt per hour assessment of all electric bills for the purposes of funding the sustainability coordinator position. Now, um, there's a question as to whether or not this is actually legally required or not. And I'm waiting uh, a response from Kate Federoff on this. Um, the board, the select board has already voted this and um, we don't know whether or not this has to actually go to town meeting or if it's a you know, a um, sort of a uh, referendum question or, or what. Um, this is very likely to come out of the warrant based on input from town council. Yeah, Jeff, to that, to that end, I, I strongly endorse that it come out. Um, first of all, the language is not correct. It's not a uh, one-tenth of a cent uh, kilowatt, uh, per kilowatt hour surcharge on all electric bills. It's only rate pairs not taxpayers, only rate payers who opt in to pay the aggregation rate. It's not an assessment on all electric bills. Um, I'd like to see it removed for many different reasons, including the fact that it's going to present unnecessary and challenging discussion about additional taxes on residents. Uh, and uh, I think the facts need to be presented um, much more clearly than they have been to date if we're even going to have that discussion. And again, I don't think that discussion is necessary given that the town's already exercised its authority. And more importantly, um, the public was informed of this decision by, by public notice back in April. So um, yeah. I, I'm making yeah. my, clear, my feelings known. I know you need to wait for town council, but I, I, I would just want to get on record as saying that. I, don't, I, 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 I do not disagree with your opinion. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, to that point, um, I would strongly encourage you tomorrow to give Kate a deadline on the answer. We've been talking about this article for about two weeks, and I'd like an answer. It's not that much of a heavy lift, and um, um, we need to start cleaning up some of these remaining pieces. The other item I want to draw your attention to is under, under Article 14, capital expenditures. My understanding is that um, we've been informed the wastewater treatment plan evaluation and repairs item is no longer needed. Is that correct? Well, um, we have a, we're carrying currently a $54,500 appropriation and um, based on input from our facilities manager, that number is uh, probably pretty high. So I'm down probably at least by half. I have, a, I have some information from the facility manager that the entire amount can be deleted from the uh, warrant. Well, I, I, yeah, I hear you, but I mean, I don't feel comfortable doing that because uh, this is an important facility and um, I don't, you know, I, I just want to have some money there uh, in case a, a pump breaks during the course of the fiscal year or there's a, a compressor that breaks during the course of the fiscal year that we don't have money to pay for it. So, I mean, That's why we have a reserve fund. Yeah, I, I, I get it, but, um, you know. That's an old uh, facility. That's an old facility, and it, it, it's an important facility because it takes care of all of the, uh, obviously, all of the sewage that comes out of the schools. And you know, I I worry about not having money there to make repairs. Would you uh, kindly reconcile that number with your facility manager? Because whatever number's in there has to be defensible to the finance committee and to the town. I don't want to have um, a slush fund there. It, uh, it's a specific capital item, and it either it either needs to reflect actual repairs that are planned or not. So if you could clear that up once and for all, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you, sir. Anybody Almost. else got anything on the warrants? <clears throat> and that's what I have, sir. 
Okay, thank you. We good? For now? For now. For now. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, board bu board business, reserve fund and year end transfers. Mrs. Uh, Sharon, Sharon's here. Emmerich, uh, town accountant. She's coming up to sit with us. She's got a nice, beautiful blue mask, too. <laughs> My niece made it for me. Oh, very nice. <laughs> So okay. what are you trying to get out of us tonight? <laughs> That's not very nice. Tonight, everything I'm presenting to you is within department. Okay. So just, just, just reconciling the buckets. Right. This is right. how I refer to it. Um, so first up is uh, the board. We need to transfer $275 from professional development to your um, supply line. It just they bought a lot of toner and uh, toner and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we need to transfer $142 for me from my professional development line to my professional and technical line because um, they didn't have any money in my budget for my clerk's pre-employment schedule. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Gotta have Didn't that. plan on that. Uh, <laughs> and you plan tight. <laughs> I, well, I, I do, exactly. <clears throat> I planned exactly for my phone bill and nothing more, so when I got this, I went, okay. <laughs> um, next one is the election budget. We need to transfer $300 from the election worker salary line to their supply line, just covering their food and, sub okay. and expenses that they have for the elections. Sharon, um, the yep. town, as a result of increasing the hours and the coverage for the town election, you're telling us that the town clerk's not incurring any more expenses for poll worker salaries? She still has money in her budget for the poll workers, so, okay. you know, right, because it's going on tomorrow, is that correct? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so she's got money to cover it. And this is giving her a little extra money, so if tomorrow they go out and buy some food and, and whatever supplies, this covers that. Okay. This, this kind of gives her a little bit extra to, to cover anything they incur tomorrow. Sure. It's going to be a very long day. It is going to be. Yes, I heard Bonnie on the phone all day today calling people <laughs> to staff everything for tomorrow. Um, next one is the police department. Uh, I'm going to transfer $11,000 from their overtime line to their professional and technical. Um, they had some labor council and, and an examination promotion service kind of a thing. So a couple big expenditures that came out of their, out of their budget this year. Uh, next one is the fire department. I'd like to transfer 15000 from his regular salary line to purchase the services. Um, he had some service on the elevator. He's had uh, vehicle maintenance on engine one, engine four, a little on ladder one. So. <laughs> it's around. <laughs> is this uh, stipend savings? Uh, not a lot of fires. So it's the reg regular on from which I believe you would be pulling up. Excuse me? Keep, you're pulling it from the hourly? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Um, next is our highway department, just transferring $214 from office supplies to professional development. This is for continuing ed for the, for the men. Um, snow and ice, transferring $33,000. I'm going to take 10 from their salary line, 23 from their quote, plowing line, and this will cover like cost of sand and salt kind of thing. Uh, next one is sewer collection. We want to transfer $4,600 from the professional and technical line to the repairs and maintenance. Um, they had to repair their hot water heater and I'm thinking they still may have to pump the septic one more time so this gives them enough money to do one more. Uh, 
Um, next one is library. I'd like to transfer $3,000 from the children's librarian salary line to purchase the services. Again, she had um, repairs to the elevator. They put in a new water heater and gives her a little bit of a buffer to get it through the end of the year. Um, next one is the water department. I would like to transfer $50,000 from their supplies to purchase of services. Um, they've had, as I was telling up quickly before I came up, spent over $28,000 on well repair. Um, so, get them a little bit of money to get them through the end of the year. Get them out of the hole with a little bit of money to spare. Is this the water enterprise? Yes. Okay. And you said 50000 50000 yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is, like I said, all of this is staying within one department, we're just moving lines. Um, next one is the facilities department. I don't know how many, you, well, I don't know if you want to, well, actually, I guess you guys approved. We have Mark's signature. So it's 30000 for the software. I don't think we saw that last week. You didn't, you didn't do it last week. Um, oh, we did. Before that, probably could have done it before that, but I'm I'm, we'll just I'm do not it. sure. We'll do it yeah, again. we'll we'll do it again. So anyway, so this has taken thirty thousand four hundred and sixty-three dollars from the um, admin salary line to the equipment line, and this was for the software package and asset tracking package he was supposed to be getting. Um, and then this next one is for. $2,362 from the salary line for the facilities manager. And it's, I'm sticking a 133 in purchase of services, 1,000 bucks in supplies, 800 bucks into professional development, and 429 um, in the equipment that was the tablet that, that um, Chris had bought for him. Okay. Um, so it just kind of covers everything that didn't actually have a budget in it, so right. this is covering all of our spaces. And that is it. Question <laughs> one. If you want to say that is it. <laughs> yes. Two. Yes. So you had provided information last week, and that's what I'm going off as you're going down. Um, most of the items increased in the amount, not much, but um, most of the Exactly, amount. yes. How does that affect the net? So last week you had a net of $545,990. Does that change the net at all? Help me out here with the accounting piece of it. Um, what was it last week? Um, last week I have a net of $545,990 with both the transfers in and out and then also, um, yeah, I'm looking at this. Okay. Last week. I'm just wondering if the bottom line changes there. Um, It does. Oh, I took out the facilities. It does, but I went the wrong direction. But I took out all the stuff I had, so I don't have a good one. It will change. Up or down? I will. Down. I. It'll go down. Yeah. Okay. Because we're doing more transfers than they all kind of went up a little bit. I was running reports to take, even though you hadn't <laughs> approved it yet. I was including today's warrant in everything and just trying to get us out right. the next few weeks from here. So all of them kind of went up slightly, so the net will be will be lower. And I think you saw the email from Jeff last week about the comments from the Finance Committee on the line item transfer for the select board's budget. It, at the yeah. time, was 44500 and then I think you've updated that? I have. All yes. right. Um, can we talk about that for Yes, a we may. All right. So yes. you have all the vendors listed, Beacon Integrated, Epstein in August, uh, uh, Feely, Lord Environmental Meet in Tallerman, um, and then Weltman and Moskowitz. Um, what I don't see here is what was originally budgeted for each of these uh, vendors. So I can't compare which particular vendor we spent more money on or which vendor is I money am not budget. privy at all to what you, you know. Okay. 
Lord, I know that one was a special project for thirteen thousand five hundred. Okay. Um, I I don't can, know off the top of my head to tell you. Can you? What, I have the same question. If I could, if you don't mm -hmm. know, can I ask you to do this? Can you show us how much was spent by those major vendors in FY19? Yep. So that we can have a reasonable base to say we spent X on Talamer and Mead in FY19, and this year it's this. Okay. We'll see some movement because I'm guessing your 20 budget was built off of 19 base expenditures reasonably. Reasonably. That would be, yeah. Tina, I think that's the only place you're going to find that. Yeah. I was thinking of the exact same thing as you were. Okay. And the other question I'd have is... Get that to you in the morning so you can see it before you go to the finance committee tomorrow. That'd be great. Uh, they're meeting on Wednesday, actually. Oh, they're meeting on Wednesday? Well, isn't Tomorrow's that... election day. Oh, very true. <clears throat> but I'll try to get it to you tomorrow. That'd be awesome. All of you. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> with the Mead and Tallerman, I'm looking at some of the line items. Some of these fall, it looks like, under planning board, um, EDA, and then conservation as well. It was work done for... Uh, I can I can go back through because I can move them. If planning board, you know, not to put them, oh, I won't move it and put them in the red, but I I think they all yeah, what is probably N, what still. What is N. Gillen? Hmm? Yeah, I didn't recognize N. Gillen. Yes, sir. Oh. Prior police department employee. N. Yeah. Well, a lot of the litigation for the town comes to our budget. Right? It, yeah, it was. I mean, you yeah, know. That, that's, I think, a, a medical thing. John, if yeah. I can jump in, if I can jump in oh. here for a second, John. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, that's a long term um, liability claim from a former police officer, I believe. So I just wanted to point out to uh, Sharon that yep. uh, there are a lot of uh, expense expenditures uh, against the uh, selectmen's professional and technical account uh, from Epstein in August, which mm -hmm. is uh, for the cable uh, renewal application. And uh, as I said, as I sent to you, I think previously into the board, um, this is a separate article. It should not be posted to the selectmen's professional and services account. Right. We had the article, if I'm correct, in October. Yep. Okay. The bills that are still sitting in your budget were paid before October because I did said the same thing. Thing is, these don't belong here. Then I looked at the article and went, oh, okay. So we actually paid these <laughs> before we got the article. So. Um, Which uh, Epstein and Epstein in August. August. Yeah. So I yeah. see one in July. I see two in July, but not, I. Don't, there's, there's maybe only four of them, something like that. Yeah, okay. Um, but they were paid before we actually voted the article in October. Okay. For a you know a certain amount of money to to pay for this, so it came before we had the approval of the article. The other, uh, Sharon, the other expense that I'm yep. concerned about is about Beacon Integrated Solutions, which is a grant. Yep. Uh, posted uh, at least uh, to the selectmen's um, this is for the landfill solar project um, this is a grant we received and um, I don't believe it should be posted to the selectmen's expense account it should be posted All right, so a grant you got a grant for the solar yeah yes yeah that's the is that the MIAA one um, it's not um, it's not Maya it's a it's, no, a, it's a state it's a state grant that was received by the town, I think, for approximately twenty-five thousand um, dollars. All right, I will look for it. I can assisting, move it. The, assisting the town in getting the solar installation installed. The final one that I question is uh, E. Welt, Weltman. Uh, yeah. Um, and that's for Sun Edison. Sun Edison is a is a matter of litigation, and. Uh, I think we have a different account that we can take that money out of versus the selectman's professional services account. This is a, a settlement account. I do remember that discussion. Yeah. Well, if you can look into it, Sharon. Settlement for. Well, it was a it was a tax it was a tax issue with the assessors. Very. It was litigation. It was litigation, and we already. 
victim, I think it was $20,000, John, if you remember correctly. I believe you're correct. That yeah. I did pay, $20,000 judgment. But then yeah, that's also a fee. So the, expenses, the, the expenses should come out of that same account, I think. Which will bring okay. down the $40,000, $43,000 number down very significantly. Okay. Should, which should. Um, so, well, then you want answer some question. of the questions from the finance committee. Okay. And um, Jeff, the money for the, the grant for Beacon Integrated, is that the um, Meta 8 grant? It is. And it was received November 18, 2019. All okay. right. And that was it down for me. M-E-T-A. Okay. All right. We'll go look for it. That's good. So all that should, Sharon, all that should help the finance yep. committee have a little bit better, you know, indigestion. Yep. No, I will clean this up tomorrow and I'll send you in the fight. I'll send okay. out a new sheet so you can all is, is that in, see what is, I moved. Are you done now with transfers for the rest of the year, as far as you know? And so from what I <laughs> hear, Sharon. It blows up in the next week or so. You used, <laughs> 2020, you cannot say that in 2020. Come on. You used favorability to um, accomplish these uh, deficiencies within line mm -hmm. items and so forth. I haven't heard you once use the word transfer from the reserve fund to any of these accounts. So you've left that largely intact, haven't you? I have. Uh, there's been a, I think we had a little drag on that earlier in the year. It's about 285,000 right. still in it. Is I think that right? We've had three transfers from it so far this year. Um, when it comes to the end of the year, I, it's almost easier for me to do it this sure. way because if I'm going to make it a reserve fund, it's got to be unforeseen and extraordinary and whatever. So then I really, you know. It can't just be that, yeah. you know, right. I don't know that buying too much Tona, you know, qualifies as, as, as you know. As you look back, uh, comparatively, do you mm -hmm. usually have that amount of money left in the reserve uh, fund at the end of a year? Reserve usually is still sitting because I will do line items probably before reserve fund. Mm -hmm. The reserve fund they kind of use more throughout the year. So you get... You know, find out in October yeah. that you just got a ten thousand dollar bill. You know, that's when they'll do their reserve fund transfers because it's an emergency or, or whatever. Right. At the end of the year, I try to use the favorability of other accounts right. first, mm -hmm. so I don't have to well, weigh every transfer of is you know well, will it meet the criteria for the. The reason I'm asking is it's of note that the finance committee's done some modeling and they're showing that um, one model they're doubling the reserve account for FY21. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially putting aside $600,000, which is the very limit of our financial guideline. Okay. And one has to wonder, you know, what is that needed for? If yeah. we're not even spending the 300 typically that we right. get. It's a, just a well, I, observation. Yeah. Uh, and depending, I mean, but if everybody's going into 21 tight on their budget, I'm not going to have this play at the end of the year. So, it, more often than not, probably would come out of the reserve fund for 21. Right. On the other hand, for about six months out of yeah. FY21, we'll have the CARES Act to fall back on for a lot of the unforeseen emergencies that are associated with the. Uh, well, for the, the COVID, virus. yes. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And Lord Environmental is mm -hmm. on here for the 13,005. Mm -hmm. I thought that my memory is telling me that was a reserve fund transfer. It was. It was. So at the bottom. Are you looking at the one I sent to you today? Uh, I sent you. Yes, I am. Okay, yes, I so at the bottom of the sheet, yeah, okay. it shows that the 13.5 came yeah. into your budget, and the 13.5 I paid today. Okay, and then that's the only other thing would be out. coming back to the FY19. So all yeah. that's really left on here then, Epstein Law has been accounted for, Beacon Integrated has been accounted for, um, Garion has been accounted for, Weltman and Moskowitz has been accounted for. So then the only things we're really looking at that could be different than FY19 are the Mead, Tallerman, and Costa and the Feely. So looking at what F19 was yeah. uh, would be helpful so we can compare to see today because I think the finance committee indicated they had some qu some questions about that. So that would be, again, helpful. I have one, one Go ahead. additional question. 
Jeff, are you prepared Wednesday evening to present to the Finance Committee the town warrant and the answers associated with the questions that they asked last week? I am going to be on the coast of Maine. Okay, good. Okay. All right, so I just need to, so. We need, need a motion to, to for speak. All right, before you do that, yep. I've got to make sure I'm, I'm moving everything yep. I need to. So, Beacon is. I think the, the Meta 8 grant? Yeah, and but which? Solar. Oh. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? Which company? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which company? Which Be Beacon. Yeah. That's the vendor oh, is sorry, Beacon sorry, Integrated so, Solutions. Sorry. Beacon is the one that's going to the solar grant. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Okay. Whatman is going to the settlement account. And Epstein would be the cable article from October Town Meeting. Right, which I'm not sure if I can move. That's the one we paid it prior until we got... Um, the article. That's 3,787. Okay. Um, you have a November, uh, well, November 18th. Okay. Um, and, but I will scan through and, you know, move anything for planning or zoning if I see it all because yeah. they still yeah. have money. Okay. Thank so you. So I will move what I can. Great. I need a motion to. Uh, motion to approve the proposed transfers um, as provided by Ms. Emmerich. And do we have a second? Uh, second with the comment that uh, with the changes and edits that you referenced. There we go. All those in favor? All right. Opposed? Motion carries. Sharon, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I will give you these oh, two yeah, signs because then we need to pass those off. So I did not, I also said in my email, I did not give an updated um, transfer for the selection. I have to fix all this, so that might be uh, next Monday. So it won't be for discussion uh, by the Finance Committee on Wednesday evening? It may be a discussion, but I will, I'll fix the list, okay. and I will send the list to you as well as them. Okay. Um, Follow yeah. on Monday, we'd vote on it, and then go yeah. to them again. Right, right. Okay? Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. All your help. Any other business? Uh, just real quick, James, Keith, Sean, uh, Scott Moles, and I had a look at Nine Green Street on Friday, um, and I think we'll be getting an update. I won't give it tonight because uh, okay. I think I'm still waiting for Scott to weigh in on, on uh, who's going to take that, um, but we will probably update the board, uh, one of the two of them, James or Scott. Um, and then we have my appointment. So uh, this is to the Metro West Regional Collaborative. My new appointment would be uh, effective June 15th. So we need a motion to appoint me as the Metro West Regional Collaborative uh, representative, which I would very much enjoy to do. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. And then we have the proposed dates. For uh, the remainder of 2020, and, and you gentlemen, apparent well, Mark, you got out of the. Uh, that's what leaving the board will do. We don't need to know your vacation plans. But apparently, John, you have no vacation plans, and the only date that we don't have on the that I won't be here for is August 17th. But that's still a scheduled meeting date. So um, this is a motion to approve um, meeting weekly on Monday evenings through the end of 2020. Wait a second. Second, with a modification, there may be some upcoming vacations. This is going to be a catch as catch can. can always the newly can't formulated can't. board will make those uh, right. decisions as we roll around because that doesn't include any presumptive members. Okay. So. That seems reasonable. There. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. And then we also have what looks to be a lease term for um, the Veterans Services. Metro West District as tenant uh, for the with the town of Holliston. It's a lease for them. Uh, it's a two-year term, effective September 1st, 2020, until August 31st, 2022. Excellent. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And then one last comment. I following the senator and representative's uh, comments earlier this evening, I'm wondering, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on directing our town administrator, Jeff, to draft a letter to our uh, federal representative, um, Representative Clark, 
um, requesting more flexibility, more funds from the federal government. We were going to get some, it sounded like the school committee chair was going to get some um, information, copies of letters, and I, I'd love to see our board be a part of submitting a request or a letter um, looking for that, or at least to see a draft of what one looks like for a debate. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. That's it, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. John. I'd just like to take this moment to say goodbye, Mark. Um, a few years ago when I uh, started to uh, imagine running for this board, I knew I would hopefully have the opportunity to serve with you. I've known you for years through Alliance. Um, all the good things people say about you are very true. You're an uh, extraordinarily hard worker. Um, the, the commitment you have to this town is um, something that's quite genuine, and um, it, it comes through. Um, you've been a great chairman, a great colleague over the last two years as I've served with you learned a lot from you, and I want to thank you very much for your service to the town. And uh, I'll see you around. I know that. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but please accept my heartfelt thanks for all your service. It's thank been you. a pleasure, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you. And I wish the two of you and Ben Sparrow, uh, who will be joining you, my, my very best uh, luck, and also uh, um, hopefully things will eventually calm down so that you can have uh, uh, meetings that aren't quite so long and so mm -hmm. forth, but hey, we do what we have to do, right? We do. We well, do. do it with grace and kindness. Well, thank you. You're, you've been absolutely um, uh, the best mentor that I could ask for, and oh, I will you. forever be grateful for all of the help you've given me, and it's been a pleasure and an honor to serve alongside you. Well, so thank, thank you, you very much. And I will miss the two of you, too. And with that, I will take a motion. Mr. To Chairman? Finish. Yes. Mr. Yes, Chairman, sir. can I just ask a question? Um, are there any um, meetings that need to be posted uh, in the near future other than your regular meetings? I believe he said two, Monday and Tuesday next uh, week. Um, just next Tuesday as well, Jeff? The 30th at 715, you said? Is that, is that an executive session? No, no, I don't no, think so. Like... No, not an executive session. All right, somewhere I heard in... somewhere I heard said... that uh, there needed to be an executive session of the board, John. I don't know of one right now, Jeff. Uh, you're, if you're referring to contract negotiations with the new town administrator, I've yeah. not heard of anything from the labor council on that yet. Um, but uh, no, the other meeting on Tuesday is a regular meeting for uh, Hopping, uh, excuse me, uh, Lowland Park. Right. So, if so, anything changes, I'll be sure to let your office know. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So next Tuesday, uh, you want to post a meeting for a regular meeting board? With the planning. Yes. Yeah. yeah. With the planning board. Uh, like we talked about earlier, with the planning board. So no, I'm. I'm I'm just confused. Yeah, I'm here, but I'm just confused as to why you want to meet Monday and Tuesday. Um, you, you had suggested we meet Tuesday with the planning board because it was going to take a while. Well, that's the 30th. They so were road, road, road acceptances and so forth. So, okay. My memory, sir. So, Go Monday ahead. night we'll reorganize, we'll tackle our regular business. Tuesday night, We'll bring the planning board in and we'll discuss the Lowland Street uh, matters with uh, Chief Stone and so forth. You talked about that earlier this evening, Jeff, and I agree it should be a separate meeting Tuesday evening. Okay? Open to the public, we have said right. as well. Okay? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we had scheduled that for the 30th of uh, June. Right. Which is Tuesday. Okay. okay. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that Tuesday? It is Tuesday, right? Yeah. 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 Regular meeting Monday, planning board Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Jeff. I got it. Six twenty-nine regular meeting, and six thirty road acceptance. I mean road. Yeah. I mean uh, Lowland Industrial. Planning. Planning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a motion to adjourn. You have that, sir. <laughs> Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, folks, and good luck. And thank you for. Uh, all of your patience. Good night.